welcome everyone to the January 22nd, 2013 Chalkopee City Council meeting. Um, I call the meeting to order at 7.02. Ms. Weckman, could you please um, make the roll? Call the roll. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Sherman. Here. Councillor Lehman. Here. Councillor Clay. Here. Councillor Whiting. Here. Mayor Tan. Here. We all stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> no, I was thinking if we should have the Boy Scouts do it or not. Um, all right, item number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Mr. McNeil. Mr. Mayor, we would like to add uh, 12A. This would be a closed session for the purpose of discussing the purchase offer for the downtown fire station. Anything else? All right, I will uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda. So moved. Second by Councillor Clay, second by Councillor Whiting. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number four, consent business. Anything that needs to be removed from consent? Mr. Mayor, Mr. I, I just note two items. Um, 4D2 has a correction. Uh, that actually should be step C rather than uh, step D. In 4D3, because that went out with the packet Friday afternoon, the Civil Service Commission had not yet taken action, but the recommendation is to appoint a particular officer uh, to fill a temporary sergeant position for a 30-day period. Councilor Lehman? Can we uh, approve the consent agenda, uh, noting that D2 is an update regarding hourly rate and D3 is the actual person? I can certainly put that into the uh, motion. Is that taking them off? And, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll second that. All right, so uh, motion by Councillor Layman, second by Councillor Whiting. <coughs> uh, Mr. McNeil, would you please read the consent agenda? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 4D1 approves the job description, authorizes advertisement for the natural resources technician position to be located in the Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Department. 4D2 contained the correction. That authorizes a hiring of K-Tron as police receptionist in the police department at step C of grade one of the 2013 non-union pay plan, contingent upon successful completion of the required pre-employment medical uh, exam and drug test and psychological screening. 4D3 had an update that authorizes a temporary appointment of Officer Gary Kern to the position of sergeant in the police department at step three of the current wage scale for sergeants for a period January 29th to February 28th due to two sergeants currently being on light duty. 4F1 approves a payment of bills and electronic transfers in the amount of $3,647,372.88. 4F2 approves minutes of the City Council meeting of January 8, 2013. 4F3 approves the application and grants a temporary on-sale liquor license to Minnesota Farm Winery Association for an event to be held April 20th, 2013 at Canterbury Park. 4F4 approves an application grants a temporary on-sale mm -hmm. liquor license to the Church of St. Mark's for its Winterfest event to be held February 2nd, 2013. 4F5 approves applications for and grants a massage therapy business license and a massage therapist license to Angelique Vogel, 1061 Madison Avenue South. 4F6 approves the application grants a massage therapist license to Crystal Roberts, 1667 17th Avenue East, Suite 107. 4F6 Approves a contract with the firm of Ker uh, Kern to winter very limited for the 2012 audit process, the amount of $39,600 with an additional allocation if needed for a single audit process in the amount of $3,100. And 4F7 authorizes the execution of a joint powers agreement with Scott County for the sentencing the service program for the year 2013. Very well done, sir. Any discussion on those items? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Moving on to item number five, recognition of involved citizens by city council. Anybody out there uh, would like to speak on an item that is not currently on the agenda for this evening? All right, seeing none, we move on to uh, item 6A, public hearing for East Shockby Industrial Sewer Improvements. Um, I'll entertain a motion, a public hearing. Council Chairman? I move to open the public hearing for East Shockby Industrial Sewer Improvements. Do we have a second? 
Seen by Councilor Clay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Loney. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council, members of the audience. This uh, item is to consider a sanitary sewer extension into the, the areas that's known as East Shakopee Industrial, uh, which is located um, east of 70th Street and south of County Road 101. Uh, the council passed the resolution 7264, which received the report, and it's called for a hearing for tonight. This item is uh, to conduct this uh, public hearing and listen to the public as uh, uh, property owners as uh, to the input that they have. And council should be reminded that this project is to move forward. That is a council initiated project and it will need four fifths vote to proceed. Some other information before I go into the uh, PowerPoint that I did on January 15th for the property owners that we did order preparation of feasibility report on October 16th of 2012. Council did receive the report on December 18th, 2012 <coughs> and is included in your packet. January 15th, we did conduct a information meeting. We did have eight property owners attend the meeting or eight persons representing seven <coughs> properties. The uh, owners uh, in, in attendance were generally in favor. We did ask some good questions as far as the acreages, assessment payments, sewer service requirements, and waivers of assessment that we did mention and which I will go through later on here. So <clears throat> tonight you'll be considering resolution 7273 a resolution ordering the improvement and preparation of plans and specs for the East Shakopee Industrial Sewer Improvement Project, project number 2013-4. I'll go through a PowerPoint right now that explains some of the particular issues and, and items that are particular with this project. Location map, again, this is uh, 70th Street in this area. The Blue Lake Treatment Plant is right over here. We actually did study this <coughs> project area in 2003 and I kind of jokingly said we could actually put a catapult over here and sling it over the highway <coughs> and it's that close to sewer uh, but we can't really do that but it didn't go it didn't pass in 2003 but we are looked at now a couple of options which I'll go through but this is the project area that is not on sewer they do have water most of these parcels there's one parcel down here that was part of a the area where they had the pollution fire in 1987, 88. Um, very difficult to serve, does not have water, difficult to serve. We did not propose service. And we did contact those people. If they wanted to be included, they should let us know and have not. Anyway, we did analyze two systems. One is called a lower pressure system slash gravity system. And I'll explain that, but most of that is a, is a pressure system that does not include a force uh, lift station. The other system analyzes the gravity system slash lift station slash force main. And we'll go through the cost. There's quite a bit of cost differential in this. The reason why we would recommend the low pressure system is the cost, lower assessment, but also lower maintenance. We do not have to maintain a lift station with the other system. Some items that we had mentioned previously is a SAC credit policy consideration for this area. This was identified in our policy that we did pass as an area that we, in order to get sewer in this area, that we would be willing to contribute to SAC credits. Currently, a SAC credit is $2,435 per unit from the Met Council, <laughs> and a city SAC is $475. We would ex waive those or give credits and waive the city SAC credit in exchange for a waiver of assessment appeal. That's what we wrote in the report. We estimate there's about 20 SAC units on existing parcels and potentially 12 more on undeveloped parcels in this area. We don't really know what the exact SAC units will be. That would have to be determined by the Met Council, but we did an estimation based on water flow records we got from Shakopee Public Utilities. So this is a low pressure system and <coughs> If you watch my arrow, there is a there is a gravity pipe right to here. We would be able to extend gravity to right about this location, which is not quite the stagecoach road. We can get gravity to there. 
The rest of this would be what's considered a low pressure system where people would pump into the system, it'd be under pressure, and it would force the sewage to the gravity system and then out and then into the Blue Lake treatment plant. That's the, that is the lower cost alternative and the one we're recommending. <coughs> the gravity system, what we call, is gravity again to this point, and then a gravity line all the way back to this location where we have a lift station, and then a gravity line all the way to this lift station, and then a force main all the way back to where there's gravity here. A lot, of, a lot more piping, lift stations are not cheap, they co quite a bit of cost and also cost to maintain. Estimated SAC, this is the map just showing the SAC units. The red would be existing parcels. The green would be parcels that are vacant and there's no building yet. Those are our estimated SAC credits that we could provide. Another item we talked about at council level is a trunk sanitary sewer charge in this area. Previously, there was supposed to be a trunk line that would go through this area, be extended across 169 to serve areas south of 169. And when we analyzed this, when the South Bridge development came in, that trunk line would actually would have come out of the ground. We could provide the trunk service that we needed through the South Bridge development. Thus, there's no trunk line needed in this area. Once this pipe is completed, it goes right into the Blue Lake treatment plant and we recommend no trunk charge be charged in this area. Some other particulars with this, the UP Railroad does have a yard building in, a, in, a, in their switching area down by Stagecoach. They do want sewer and water. They, we've been talking to them. Um, and the water service charges would be determined by Shockley <coughs> Public Utilities and that would be a separate agreement that we would have with them. All other existing developed parcels do have water service and the undeveloped parcels would also be would also have water service. This is a typical grinder pump sketch. This would be your building, sewer pipe would come into the grinder pump. Grinder pump would pump it out into our pressure system. There'd be a check valve somewhere in here. So it pumps it into the system, it's under pressure. Eventually, everybody pumping the system forces the sewage all the way back to, gra to the gravity. Here's the bottom line, the cost differential. The lower pressure system is $4,241 an acre. The gravity system is $89.48 an acre. Almost double, or more than double. So when we did this, we had 130 acres based on the county records that we had of acres that would be assessed that we believe. Take that times the rate that we mentioned for the lower pressure system and these are the assessment amounts. $605,000 total project cost. Likewise with the gravity system, what we call gravity lift station force main, more than double, same acreage and you can see that the assessments go up quite a bit. <clears throat> One area that we, from the meeting that we had, Superior Supply, <coughs> their acreage that, we sh that was shown from the county records is, they have is different. We're working with them. Uh, looks like they'll have a reduction in their acreage. That is something that we would address at the assessment hearing stage of this project later on when we calculate all the ac acreages again and get final numbers on the assessments. Finally, the property owner's responsibility that we mentioned to them, they would have the cost of connection, grinder pump, can vary depending on how much they use for water. Most of the systems out here are fairly low water usage. Ziegler's probably the biggest. Um, so they would, they would have to pay for that pump and maintain that pump. We, our policy that we have in ordinance is they have three years to connect and requires a sewer permit. Assessment term is 10 years unless council approves otherwise. We, we mentioned to everybody that they need a waiver of assessment appeal um, in order to attain the SAC credits and waiver of city SAC. And I, <clears throat> I think I did include a waiver example in your packet. So I'm not gonna show that unless otherwise there's questions on that. So I'm done with my presentation. 
we're recommending the low pr pressure system because of the lower assessment costs and the lower maintenance to the city. And the fact there are quite a, most of the property owners are not big water users out there. That presentation was more exciting when you're talking catapults, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, do we have any uh, questions <coughs> from staff? Councilor Lehman. Uh, three of them. The, the, does the road then get re reconstructed or tore up to put this pipe in? Let's see if I... The road will not, we're going to be putting, Stagecoach Road will we'll have to bore underneath the road, but we're going to be in the ditch area here. Okay. And again, the beauty of a pressure system <coughs> pipe, you just have to be seven and a half feet down to keep it from freezing. So we'll, in areas that we need to put services in, our feasibility study recommended we would be boring underneath the road. Okay, next one. D does the uh, estimate assessment amount include the grinders and the hookup to the building? No, okay. that's a separate cost. It just includes, and I would like to go back, that's a good question, actually. Um, this, this area right here, this would have a valve, a curb box, just like you have a water shut off. And this would probably would be right at the property line. We would put the main line in and a sewer pipe service line to the property line. Then the property owners would have to come in, install their sewer service to that. We would also recommend that from where the valve is, basically anything in our right of way, but from the property line in, we should be maintaining that. It's different than the other type of sewer service system we have. Main reason if something breaks here, we can't wait for the property owner to fix their service line. That's under pressure. We got to get it fixed. So anything from the property line in, that would be a city maintained line. Are the uh, properties that you talk to at your meeting aware of, the, of that? Yep. And the cost for the grinders and stuff? Yep. Okay. Yep. And then um, the waiver of assessments, <laughs> if they don't agree to a waiver of assessment, they don't get the SAC credits. Um, but I guess my bigger question is the cost benefit analysis without a waiver with some of these parcels when the assessment amount is pretty <coughs> substantial. <coughs> Do you have an opinion on that? <coughs> well, it's always, you know, the people that are, anytime you come in an area where there's septic system and you're replacing it, it depends on the quality of their system and the need. Um, I think for the most part, most of the property owners recognize it's time to get these areas on the sewer. The systems are, now there's some areas, some systems are fairly new out there, not as old like Cargo Van Gogh and Ace Trailers. I think they're fairly new. I mean, less than 20, but whether or not um, they would appeal their assessment, they also are recognized that the value the city is giving with the value of the SAC credits and the waiver of the city SAC fee. So there's a trade-off there. Do you appeal your assessment and not get what the city's providing? And, uh, you know, you think you're going to get a better deal by appealing. Any other questions? Councilor Whiting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the pollution control site that is not on the, the map here, would that be able to hook up at a future date if that was developed <coughs> at any point? It's possible. More likely what we see, that site would be best to be combined with another parcel. The, poten the potential of contaminated soil and cleanup, even when you're digging in sewer pipes or building, would still be there. So that would be a cost. There. They have to extend the pipe this entire length down to here. So from stagecoach, that's quite a ways. They do have an easement with this, the property owner in here, but it would have some pretty high costs. So they were not, they were interested in sewer, but when we mentioned the cost, they, <coughs> okay. they, didn't, they didn't want to be involved. I, unless they're here tonight, I don't know. We, Pete Schmidt with Scott County has been talking with them and we've mentioned all the facts to them. 
if they want to be involved they would have to sign a waiver and we could we still could serve them but it would be a pretty high cost okay Councilor clay Just a quick question you said that the pipe needs to be seven and a half feet underground to keep it from freezing yes and that's just the like frost lines frost line is only 42 feet or inches I'm, so all all water pipes and sewer pipes are well your water main that you represent the shock Creek public utility yeah, all those are all main is seven and a half feet down we probably can go a little less with sewage but i'm just saying that typically you stay seven and a half feet down another reason is because ground can shift and you don't want the shifting of ground to break your pipes okay it's just a standard you i guess it just never occurred to me before that <laughs> It would be different from your frost footings. Yep, it is different okay. than your frost footings. Any other questions? All right, seeing none from council, is there uh, anyone who would like to uh, talk in the public hearing this evening? Please. <coughs> Set your name and sign in on there. Um, good evening. My name is Mike Ani, and I'm from Ziegler Incorporated. And I just wanted to make sure that the council understands that uh, we are totally in favor of this of the proposed uh, extension, and uh, um, truly are support it totally. So, thank you. Why is that? Uh, we've been waiting for it for a long time. Got a bolt broke. It's a big business. It's <laughs> yeah. going to help our property, uh, you know, down the road if we ever. If we ever have reason to sell it, I mean, it'll be connected uh, totally. So that's good. Right now, we uh, we have a storage tank that you know handles some of our sewage. We have to have that <coughs> pumped up quite often. We have our septic systems, and they're aging, and and it's uh, definitely time to get something done. Thank you. Totally support it. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Nobody else. You don't want to. All right. Um, okay, are there any further questions from council? Um, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing. Councilor Sherman, do we have a second? I'll second that. Second by Councilor Whiting. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, if there's uh, no further discussion on this one, I'll also entertain a motion. That's Whiting. I offer uh, resolution number 7273, a resolution ordering the, an improvement in preparation of plans and specifications for the East Shakopee Industrial Sewer Improvement Project, project number 2013-4, and move its adoption. Do we have a second? Second. Councilor Clay, second. Any discussion? Um, and I just also want to remind everyone that we need uh, supermajority on this since it's council um, initiated. So we need uh, four out of five in order for it to pass. Councilor Lehman. From there, there's uh, one, two, three. There's really only five properties assessment totals that would concern me, but they're also pretty large properties. I mean, uh, the rest of them are actually much less than replacing a, a septic system. So from a cost-benefit analysis, that doesn't really concern me on all of them, but just a few, and a few uh, are supportive of the project. So I think the risk is low enough for our behalf, and, and uh, the larger users obviously are going to see a larger benefit. <coughs> Absolutely. Good. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? passes unanimously <coughs> thank you all and thank you mr loney and engineering and <coughs> public works for uh going through this project i think it will be really good for economic development on uh, the east side of town thank you gentlemen um item number seven business removed from consent agenda we had none this evening item number eight convene uh meeting for economic development authority um <coughs> tonight we're going to have a uh Simultaneous session of council and economic development. I'm not going to go into uh, the reasons why because it's complicated. Um, but economic development advisory committee is also here 
um, this evening to discuss um, portions of it when we get to the um, EDAC goals and um, discussion of the economic development staff position we will uh, take a quick recess and everybody will meet down at the table um, but for now um, would uh, Councilor Clay would you convene the economic development authority we don't need to adjourn the council we're just going to keep no. them open to this okay I'll call the order the January 22nd 2013 economic development authority for the city of Shakopee to order uh, you please make note of the roll, Mr. Recording Secretary. Mr. Need a motion to approve the agenda, Mr. Lehman. Motion to approve the agenda. Seconded by Ms. Sherman. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. Mr. Whiting. I'll make a motion to approve the January 8th, 2013 EDA minutes. Motion to approve January 8th minutes, seconded okay. by Ms. Sherman. No. Discussion? Uh, Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? January 8th minutes are approved. Which brings us to the joint meeting with City Council. All right. Who wants to? <laughs> Which one do you want to start with? The agenda item would be the request to the Eagles Club. Do you want to go with that? Okay. Thank you, members of the council and members of the EDA, as well as members of the audience. This is, as you noted, a request for a facade improvement loan from the recently reinstituted facade improvement loan program. Remember, for this year's budget, the city council allocated 150,000. The EDAC recommended some revised guidelines, um, a cap of $15,000 on any loan and 40% of the improvement costs being eligible for a loan. Uh, the Eagles, for those who are not familiar with the building, are housed uh, just west of City Hall. This is the existing building. And the areas where they propose you're gonna improvement. Have to you're going to have to switch something there. Oh, he's on the computer. I should be on the document camera. My apologies. Here we go. Uh, so the existing structure had at one point in addition, you can see it is partially stucco, partially brick, and the Eagles propose some revisions to that, which amount to um, replacing the look of the brick with cultured stone on all three sides of the bump out. Uh, doing stucco on all three sides above that, replacing four windows and trim, as well as uh, door and trim and door and trim on the west side of the property. As the council slash EDA will see from its report, the total estimated project cost is $17,693. The amount that they would be eligible for is $7,077.20. Just to go through the process, there is a design application review committee that consists of a representative of the EDAC, the HPAC. It's facilitated by Mark Noble on our planning staff. Angie Whitcomb from the chamber has also participated on that. And they met on this application twice. At that first meeting, they felt there was a need for additional information. So our staff went about working with the Eagles to get that additional information. And the committee met again, and they did recommend with some of the changes that they suggested to the Eagles that they were amenable to, to the EDAC that they recommend to you that you, in fact, make the loan. So the request before you tonight is to approve that loan uh, with the amount of $7,077.20 for the fa facade improvements here. Um, and just to note, at the EDAC meeting where they discussed this last week, we talked about some of the follow-up on this and future applications to see what kinds of applications are being funded, how the matrix that was put together that you may recall seeing is ultimately working. 
but again, the requested action is for the EDA to approve the loan, um, and you have a copy of the loan agreement draft in your packet. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions for Mr. Leek? See none. Oh, wait, straggler. Sorry. When did we, uh, Mr. Chairman, when did we uh, change the amount to 40% for the cap of 15? It was recommended by the EDAC last year, and you approved those changes when you reinstituted the program. Okay. And that was based on the funding and allowing more properties to be able to utilize it? Um, yes. Part of the reason for that was the EDAC had recommended that the program be citywide for businesses throughout Shakopee. You did increase funding. It was uh, much smaller. It was increased to 150000 for this year. But it was thought that a smaller cap and a smaller percentage would allow the fund to be utilized for more businesses throughout the city. Previously, this program had applied either just to the downtown zoning district <coughs> or downtown and First Avenue. So it was a pretty significant expansion. Any other questions, Mr. Tabke? Just want to make you aware there's a representative from the Eagles here. I don't know if they want to uh, speak or not, but just, you know they're available if we need Okay. Them. Thank you. He heard you talking. <laughs> you could please uh, sign in on the little sure. pad up there for us. I'm Galen Pold. I'm, um, I'm um, in charge of the business part of the Eagles Club, and and we was brought to the attention of this program, so we put this uh, program together that you have in front of you, and what we're trying to accomplish is to accomplish um, our ability to look more representative, and so we can increase our business. We want to uh, increase. What we donate to the to the public, we, we uh, donated approximately ten thousand dollars last year uh, to improve the city. Whether it was somebody wanting to some help with their uh, medical bills, and we also for the Toys for Tots, we're real, we're real big with that opportunity. So that's the reason, and we also like to increase membership. And with membership, we can increase people to help us uh, continue to do that. So that's why we put this program together. So I appreciate it being available to us. Thank you, Mr. Paul. As long as we're on the, uh, if anybody wants to, to speak to this, uh, is there anybody here from the Design Review Committee or the uh, EDAC that wants to comment on this? Hello, I'm uh, George McGuire, and I'm on the EDAC. And uh, this is a program we put together. Uh, I think we really started working on it, Michael, perhaps <coughs> a year ago or so, or maybe six months ago. And and we're excited to see this program go forward here. And uh, I think I would speak for everybody on the committee that we really support what the Eagles are, are going to do. This is exactly why the program was expanded. Uh, it's this is perfect from our perspective as a as a group of people. So we wanted to expand it so that we can improve the whole downtown area, the whole business area in town. And uh, I think this is a great candidate, so. Questions, Mr. Whiting? Uh, yeah, George, uh, this was your first, one of your first, at least maybe your first, uh, with this new plan that we have put together. How did the EDAC, EDAC work with it? Was, there, was it difficult to work with the new matrix? And uh, You know, in fact, when we go into our, our breakdown, our meeting with us, uh, joint meeting, uh, a little later on, we'll cover that probably a little more thoroughly. But um, it's the first go, so there's lo some lessons learned that you go through the process and you figure out. Um, 
uh, I guess probably more appropriate would be to ask the Eagles how it worked for them because uh, ultimately that's what it's about. Um, the matrix was set up just to give us an idea, a measuring idea. The original intent of it was so that down the road, if the funds were limited, there would be a way to try to discern, you know, to differentiate between candidates if the funds were limited. Um, but I think initially at this particular period of time, uh, I, I, I'm speaking really uh, for everybody at the EDAC, and if anybody has a different opinion, they could certainly come up here, but uh, this is perfect for what our goals were. And as far as the matrix and everything else, uh, the Eagles probably could be speak on it better. Thank you. Mr. Lane. Mr. Chair, on the document we have, we, we don't really see like a plan of a finished product, but they're removing the existing sign on the building. It talks about a canopy. Will they have new signing going up to tell what it is? If you look at, I believe, if I could answer that, if you look at the thing, I believe on the canopy, they're going to have the sign on the canopy. And that's correct. Am if I you look at the illustration, that? they would remove the existing extended sign and then replace it with signage on the canopy. All right. And that signage meets our sign ordinance? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Okay. Other questions? Good. Ms. Sherman. Mr. President, I would like to offer a motion directing staff to prepare a loan agreement <coughs> for building exterior improvements not to exceed $7,077.20 for Eagles Club at 222nd Avenue West with conditions noted in the <coughs> memo. Motion Second. has been made. Seconded by Mr. Tabke. Be, be sure to note that that's 20 cents on the end. Discussion? Anybody? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, you have a new front. I just need some weather to go with it. Yeah. Item number six. Got to hold on to that one for a little bit. Got to hold on to that one. So at this point, we're going to go to the joint meeting or we're going to go to item 10A1. Yes. Back to council. Now. Yes. Okay. You're off the hook for a little bit. All right. Um, item 10A1, consider public hearing for property tax abatement for Rosemount, Inc. Mr. McNeil. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council, EDA members, and also note the uh, attendance <coughs> of the Economic Development Advisory Commission members. Uh, we are pleased that they're here and we want them to be uh, in on the discussion of this or practice beginning last year was that we would have the EDAC uh, hear items relating to certain aspects of business development. Because of time frame, we weren't able to get that done at the regularly scheduled meeting um, last week. However, uh, this is something that uh, is important and we want certainly uh, their input on it as well. This relates to a proposal from Emerson Process Management, which is also known as Rosemont Incorporated. If successful, it would occupy what's called the EDA, or excuse me, ADC2 building. And that is the uh, structure which is bounded by the yellow lines there for orientation. Highway 101 is to the north, Valley Fair is to the northwest up in this direction. This is Quarry Lake. The ADC2 building is that structure in the middle. This is something that the city, the county, the state, and Scales First Stop Shop have been working on for the past three months. Uh, the company that we've been talking with is Emerson. They are a Fortune 500 company. They have uh, worldwide locations. That they also have locations in the southwestern uh, Twin Cities area as well. A uh, representative of Emerson is in attendance tonight if you have specific questions uh, about the company and what it does. What 
they have proposed to do is to acquire 60 acres of this 108 acre parcel and would finish the ADC2 building. That was started in 2000 um, and was under construction even before platting got started at that time. The building got to about 75% completion when due to the <coughs> bursting of the technology bubble, we were advised by ADC that they were unable to complete the building. They closed it up and it's been vacant ever since that time. Just for some photos to give you an idea as to what is there now, uh, that is the building as it currently exists in its unfinished format. Uh, they have a parking lot which is in, they also have a ring road which is in and has curb and gutter, but because of the amount of weathering that's taken place over the past 11 years, much of that will have to be replaced. Emerson, if they were to complete this, would have startup costs construction related of $21 million as an investment, <coughs> and they would have another $35 million in equipment and service related purchases. The major advantage to the city and the county, and in fact this region, would be in addition to getting the building occupied, they would bring 500 well paying jobs to this area by the end of the fifth year. The average wage for those jobs would be in the mid $60,000 range. A financial impact done by Greater MSP, which is a regional development agency that works closely with Minnesota DEED and local governments, estimates that 15 to 30 percent of those 500 employees would choose to live in Shakopee. Uh, there are also the indirect jobs that are created, which are range everywhere from delivery truck drivers to additional uh, restaurant personnel to feed those 500 employees. Greater MSP had done a, an economic impact study which estimates the total number of direct, indirect, and what they call spin-off employment to have an accumulated job creation of about 1,700 over the next five years. The resulting wages, the taxes paid on those, and sales taxes are probably going to be more of importance to the state of Minnesota, but nonetheless, it is something that is of interest to us here as well. Now, in order for this to happen, Emerson has requested about $6 million in economic development assistance uh, to make this location competitive with another location that they're currently considering. If we're going to get that done, it's going to take a partnership between those jurisdictions, the city, county, and the state in order for that to happen. Now, I would also say as an aside that this area is not served by Shockby Public Utilities. It's served by XL Energy. As recently as this afternoon, they're meeting with XL, and XL has indicated their willingness to provide some favorable um, power rates in order for this to happen. Um, I'd also note that it is served by Shockby Public Utilities in terms of water. However, the demand for that is going to be fairly limited, and therefore, SPUC is not able to bring much in terms of economic incentive other than perhaps some def uh, potential deferrals on water connection charges. So let's talk about the other partnerships. First, as I noted, the state of Minnesota is involved with this. They would propose to offer up to $1.2 million. The majority of that, about a million two, would be in the form of a grant which would be going towards infrastructure. That's a matching grant and so the local jurisdiction or the assessee would have to come up with half of that, but that's a source which perhaps could go for the construction of this ring road which will need to be again uh, reconstructed. There's $500,000 potentially in a Minnesota investment fund grant and for job training they also have up to $400,000 for Minnesota Job Skills Partnership Grant. There's also one other component, and this would take a special act by the legislature, but potentially the legislature could adopt a law, could pass a law, which would exempt the Minnesota portion of building construction materials from sales tax. Depending on where that is, how much or when it is uh, put into effect, that could be another $400,000 or in that range. From the city standpoint, there are a number of waivers that we would uh, suggest you take a look at. SAC credits are something that you've identified, I believe 400 SAC credits to go towards economic development. We would suggest that up to 125 of those might go against uh, this particular location. That's about $300,000. 
there's a SAC access fee for the city SAC that's about forty thousand dollars we would suggest that you would also look at waiving uh, trunk storm water access charges that's about a hundred thousand dollars and then finally there's potentially three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in EDA funds there's uh, uh, in the city's reserves right now two hundred forty seven thousand dollars which is a revolving loan fund which has been accumulating over the years but we have never used it we would suggest that that might be something that would be termed a forgivable loan also if you should choose to do this we <coughs> would recommend that another hundred and three thousand dollars come from EDA levies fifty percent of that eighty thousand dollars which was levied in 2012 and fifty percent of the eighty thousand dollars which was levied in 2013 could just go towards that. The balance, about 22,000, 23,000, would come from EDA uh, reserves. And finally, the third uh, partner on this would be Scott County. I think an exciting opportunity here, but one for which we do not have uh, an amount of money identified right now, is the opportunity for Emerson, for Rosemont, to tie into the county's fiber optic network. This would be not only for this location, but for some other locations in the Twin Cities. I think that has a potential to uh, amount to some fairly substantial dollars. The thing that we would like to have the city and county together consider, and what is actually before you tonight, is to consider property tax abatement for this. In general terms, uh, abatement is uh, in exchange for a contractual agreement that for the company to create a uh, certain number of jobs at a, an acceptable level of wages and create value that the difference between what the existing taxes are and what the newly created taxes would be based on increased value would be in effect refunded to them after those are paid. It's similar to but not identical to uh, tax increment financing. We're recommending that you call for a public hearing to consider the abatement using the same general practices that you've done for uh, other abatement proposals before. First, we're suggesting a nine-year abatement. By statute, you can go as long as 20 years. However, neither the city nor the county has, on a, as a general rule, uh, gone beyond nine. We would suggest that we also abate only the increment that would be on the new value, which would be about 12 point one five million dollars rather than abating any of the existing value that means that the existing taxes which have been paid on this about three hundred thousand dollars would continue to come in and be distributed as they would be to the or as they have been to the other jurisdictions and finally there's what's called a fiscal disparities component uh, there's an option as to whether you take that from the uh, new increment or you spread that to the existing taxpayers our practice has been and our recommendation for you again would be to take it from the new increment so that existing taxpayers are not burdened by this. There's a memorandum in your packet from Springstead which is a city's financial analyst uh, which shows the city's impact for abatements again based on past practice which would be the nine year abatement and not spreading to other uh, taxpayers for the fiscal disparities. There's completion dates, uh, assuming that taxes will be paid in full starting in 2015. There's some inflationary assumptions there. We've been very conservative on that. We've assumed for the first three years, the nine years, that there would not be an increase in the uh, property values based on inflation. The middle three years, we've assumed 1%. And the final three years, we've assumed 2%. We've discussed this with Springstead, and again, we feel these are realistic and conservative assumptions. As you'll note, the total amount proposed for abatement by the city would be about $590,000 over those nine years. This is different than what we'll actually be negotiating with um, Emerson. There's what's called a net present value, and that is money which is based its today's value uh, versus what it would be over the nine years. Scott County has been requested to consider abatement as well. They are going to have this on the city, or excuse me, on the county board agenda on February 5th. They would call, if they are uh, so inclined, they would call for public hearing on February 19th. 
Uh, schools are also eligible to abate their portion of the increased taxes. The school board was kind enough to consider this and called for public hearing. However, after the fact, we found that this location is actually just outside of the Shockley School District. The Conklin building is within district, uh, uh, the Shockley School District. This area, however, and to the east is in 191 Burnsville, Egan Savage. So that's not on the table at this time. I would stop at this point to take any questions. Again, we have uh, someone from Emerson who is here if you have questions of them. Questions for Mr. McNeil first. <coughs> Mr. Lehman. So tonight all you're asking for is to have a public hearing. Call for the public hearing, correct. Okay. That's it? That's it. All right. Anything else? Um, would anyone from Emerson like to speak? You don't have to if you don't want to. Evening. Um, I'm Brian Harstead. I'm the uh, vice president of, fi of finance for Rosemount's North America operations, and so uh, um, pleased to have the opportunity to uh, meet the councilors and uh, see you again, Mr. Mayor, and the uh, rest of the group. And I guess uh, we just uh, appreciate the opportunity to be working with the city on this project. It's uh, an exciting one that has a uh, uh, result of some uh, great business results over the past couple of years, and we're looking forward to. Uh, many more successful years here in Minnesota. So uh, just welcome if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, appreciate to be able to continue to work with Mark and, uh, and uh, look forward to that. So, right. Anybody questions? have questions for uh, the applicant at all? All right, we're a quiet bunch tonight. All right. <laughs> thank you for That's being fine. here. All right, we appreciate thank you. that. If not, in terms of, I'm sorry. <coughs> I would highly recommend that you make the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the timing on this, the county will not act on it until the city acts on it. We have publication uh, notices that we have to give, and so the recommendation would be for this to be on a special meeting night, which would be February 12th at 7 p.m. The, action, the action, if you do choose to do that, is there's a resolution which must be, which must be adopted fund a couple of bucks for some calendars up here to see what the schedules are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I did electronically for it for you. Yeah, February 12th is a special <laughs> meeting for it. Yeah. It's the second Tuesday the second of the month. Tuesday. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, all right, so if there are any further questions at all, I will uh, entertain a motion first for the uh, resolution calling for public hearing. Dr. Whiting. Uh, I'll move to uh, resolution number 7274, a resolution calling for a public hearing on the property tax abatement for certain property in the city of Shakopee, Minnesota, and granting certain business subsidies to Rosemount Incorporated or any of its affiliates. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Clay. Any discussion? See, Councilor Lehman? We're not necessarily granting this. We're, ha we're having a public hearing to decide if we're going to grant it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Now I need a uh, motion for a special meeting. Correct? Correct. To be held Tuesday, February 12th at 7 p.m. Go ahead. Council Lehman. Make a motion to have a special meeting on Tuesday, February 12th at 7 p.m. Shakopee City Hall, Council Chambers. Do you have a second? I'll second. Council Sherman, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, move on to item numbers 10A2 and 3, but we're all going to gather down at the table here so we can have uh, a more substantive discussion. So I'll entertain a five minute recess in order to uh, get everybody in the right place. Councilor Layman? Make a motion for a seven minute recess. Seven minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second that nine minute recess. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Do we have any discussion? Amendments accepted. All right. 
Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. We are uh, in recess for nine minutes. Convene, sorry. Um, we are reconvened for the uh, Shakopee City Council meeting. We are here with the Economic Development Advisory Committee to uh, discuss a couple things. We're going to talk about uh, 2013 economic development goals for the city of Shakopee and what they're presenting um, to council and have a discussion about those. And then also um, discussion on economic development staff position. And so uh, everyone should hopefully have microphones. And thank you to... Still in session. The so AD the EDA is still in session. So President Clay, could you please reconvene the EDA as well? I don't think we ever went into recess. Uh -oh. Okay, well, I will reconvene our non recess session of the <laughs> Economic <laughs> Development Authority. All right, thank you. Would you please make note once again of the role? No, the EDAC needs to call themselves yeah, to order. Mr. McGuire, would you please call the EDAC to order as well now, since we are technically a joint meeting. Sorry, That's right. This is my first uh, time with one of Thank these. you. So I would like to call a, uh, uh, the EDAC to uh, join the meeting here, and I'd like a roll call. <laughs> Nobody does that. Okay, well. Uh, <laughs> we're, all <here. laughs> we're all here. Remember Barber? Here. Uh, Morris? Here. Love? Here. Youngs? Here. Weatherly. Here. There you have it. We're all here. George. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Um, all right. So let's start off with the um, EDAC goals portion of this. Um, and everybody should have this on the table. So, Mr. McGuire, would you please? Yeah, I'd like to uh, take first. It. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Um, one of the th a couple of just brief comments. Uh, a couple of things that you covered in tonight's agenda were things that were first started or at least we, we've been working on with the EDAC for quite a while. The uh, sewer all the way down 101 was something I think we started two or three years ago. And then obviously with the Eagles thing. So it was nice to see some successes along the way. So uh, with that, uh, the 2013 goals, uh, these things are loose, but um, <laughs> one of the first things is just to have a stronger relationship with the city council um, which is why we're having this meeting tonight, and we think it's all, I think everybody here thinks it's great from the EDAC. So um, we would like to do a follow-up and review of the lessons learned regarding the current implementation of the uh, facility improvement program, which is something that I think we're going to do on a regular basis throughout the 2013 uh, year. Um, we've already briefly had some discussions in regards to the Eagles Club, but I'm sure as other applications come in, there will be further adjustments and amendments, perhaps, or whatever to that, uh, to the current program. So uh, then moving on from there, uh, we started brief discussions on a startup loan program. I believe that was the topic of uh, one of the topics of the last meeting. And um, we don't know exactly what direction that's going to go at this point in time, <coughs> but uh, it is on the agenda. Uh, a business mentoring, uh, we did use the Minnesota School of Business for some uh, work that we did in regards to developing uh, thoughts and philosophies about Shakopee and marketing Shakopee and such. And we think that perhaps there may be a, some sort of a relationship with the School of Business with business mentoring in the future, and we can look at that. Um, <clears throat> as the Highway 101 uh, reconstruction of the bridge takes place, I think uh, it would be good this year as we find out more information in regards to it to start addressing with the EDAC on uh, some of the economic impacts for the businesses in the area, both positive as well as negative in regards to the construction project and on both sides of the river. Um, we were involved in the uh, uh, EDAC position within the uh, uh, city of Shakopee and uh, we'd like to participate in, the uh, in any ad additional discussions regarding the job description, direction for the new position, and so on and so forth. 
The Highway one, uh, 101 sewer extension, uh, obviously it was uh, discussed tonight and moved forward. Uh, a future look at the Highway 101 corridor, uh, I think is something that uh, the committee would like to look at. Uh, perhaps uh, we've kind of always used a philosophy of, of having breadcrumbs from the bridge down, in other words, having that 101 corridor developed from uh, the 169 bridge over in a more uh, significant fashion, which would draw business into downtown Shakopee. Um, uh, tax and TIF uh, abatement, uh, uh, perhaps along with that expansion along the Highway 101 corridor. Um, there are some warehouse properties along Canterbury Road, uh, the old Kmart distribution center. We'd like to at least make it a topic of discussion um, from a business standpoint so we could look at uh, anything that we could do to help stimulate that business area. Um, the old Kmart locations, um, I think we decided uh, it was a good thought for us to have some discussion in regards to, there are two facilities which are old Kmarts. Uh, one of them has just been recently sold. Uh, we don't know a lot of the details in regards to that at this point in time, but there's also the, uh, that's the one up by uh, uh, Cub Foods area. Okay. And uh, then there is the uh, Kmart, the old Kmart out on 69, 169. Um, uh, we'd also like to uh, be involved in a process this year in regards to some recommendations on the Highway 169-69 uh, interchange that's going to take place. And uh, we know that there's some concerns out there. Uh, I think there was some city sewer and water issues, if I recall correctly. There's a lot of limestone in the area. There's a lot of things that... Uh, you know, from a business uh, standpoint would have to be uh, uh, looked into. So that was one of the areas there. And just, uh, you know, the future townships within the city of Shakopee exploring that idea or anything like that. Uh, this came as a result of a meeting late in December where we all sat down and had conversation. And uh, as a whole, this was the things that we wanted to focus on this year. Thank you, sir. Anything from council that stands out on this list that uh, you love, can't stand? Council Layman. Well, I think we could probably cross a couple of things off this list. Yes, sir. We could take off the uh, 101 sewer. Yes. We can. We should have a party just because of that right there. We're crossing <laughs> things off the list. The uh, uh, facade program, what was that on here? That was the uh, first item uh, below the initial that seems to be a work in progress. It's, it's really going to be up to the folks that utilize it and, and give feedback <coughs> right. as to how to make it a more smooth process. Yes. You know, so that's, that's really, I don't think, something that really needs a whole lot of wrenches to it at this point yet until it's used enough to figure out where the kinks might be. Um, the startup loan I program. Know. One of the things we're going to have to look into with that is qualify the need. And, I mean, we don't want to give l uh, loans or grants that, that they don't pay back to folks that don't need it. Okay? So somehow we need to qualify the need. Um, business plan for success. And if you guys have thoughts or want to interrupt go for it um if you want to would rather have this be discussion than i was just dictation. gonna go down and give my kind of breakdown on all of it and then sit back and hear everybody else's too that's not what i'm thinking workshop right yeah or, <laughs> or we could do it one by one yeah mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't think it makes sense to go through the whole thing and then okay. circle back all right i, I had a con on the uh just with the facade improvement loan program i think what we talked about last <laughs> week was similar to what you're getting at which is our our goal when we began that process, if I can summarize kind of our meeting, was to more or less survey folks that come through the program. And what is, what, how did it work for them? Was it too onerous? Was, were we asking for too much information? Because you've seen the application packet. Um, we tried to redo it in a way that made sense so that the city w was accountable. The, the applicants were accountable to the city for the dollars they were asking for. But at the same time, we want to entice, we want people to use it if we're going to have it instead of not using the program. So that's, I think, you know, I think we still want it 
as an EDAC, I think we still expect it to be something that we would discuss throughout 2013 as applications come in. Um, we did discuss at length um, last meeting the Eagles project, and a lot of it was just that feeling out. Mr. Love was on the design committee, uh, was our representative, and just finding out how did that work, what was the process like. So I think that um, I think that one. Need, I think we will. Uh, it's a partial cross off. Let's put it that way. It would be nice if we could have somebody outside of your group do the follow up, so that when we're talking to the person that went through the process, they don't feel like it's somebody that has a, do a dog in the fight, so to speak. You know, whether it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a chamber that comes up <laughs> later and kind of ask them how the process, you know, somebody outside of city staff or EDAC. So well, I think we view ourselves as outside of city staff a little bit because we're, well, we're volunteers. Well, we're not staff members. We can I mean, make a recommendation on the policy. So. Uh, maybe someone oh. on, the, uh, on the, the, the committee that's meeting the design committee perhaps that's not also on EDAC because there's a few members uh, at large, I believe, uh, yeah. that are on that committee that would, would follow up on that. might make sense <coughs> to do so. I agree with that. Because the person that went through the process, <coughs> they came to you right. to, to go through that process. <laughs> so for them to come back and – they might be skittish. Criticize the process. They might be skittish on <laughs> yeah. saying what a well, bad process. Well, you well but they didn't. Right. With all due respect, they didn't but come to us. They <coughs> came first to that design. They committee. actually came to the committee yeah. first. Right. Right. They and came. So I don't know if having them circle back and right. go back to the committee to report on how the committee did would right. be the well, right. Well, I don't thing think do. we should have them be circling back. I think we should be have somebody going to them. Yeah, I think that's already planned and is already going. Yeah. So I yeah. think that we're taking lessons learned and best practices right. from that. So let's try and pull this up a little bit from details of things and let's talk about bigger overall things so from the edax point of view what what do you guys want from us this evening what what uh feedback can we get do we want like a top five things that we want on your list to work on from this list and other things what what's the best way for outcome of this well, uh, Mr. Mayor, you, you kind of said pulling back and going to a high level. I want a big vision. What, what are you guys seeing? Uh, what are your priorities when you look at this list? Um, what fits into the big overall plan uh, for economic development going forward? Or other ideas. Uh, yeah. And I think yeah. also one of the things that we would like to know as a group, it was talked about a lot um, in our planning session, is, is how do you want the relationship to be going forward as uh, we want to accelerate the process and keep things moving, things come to us, then they go to you, and it, is there a better way to do that? Is there some, for, is for some things one way and some things another way, how do we want to interact so we can be the most efficient and responsive for the businesses who are coming to us? Well, to expand on that a little bit, <coughs> um, I wasn't at the goal setting meeting, but I did send over some email thoughts, which I, which I think led to some discussion with EDAC, but I think it's critical to point out to City Council that you have a group of appointed volunteers here who have several things going for them. They've got a high level of interest in economic development in the City of Shakopee. You've got some who do economic development for businesses in the City of Shakopee and just some really passionate folks and I think we're putting ourselves out there for you guys to use as resources, as consultants, as a sounding board for some of these issues. So I think we wanted to make that clear in terms of a stronger relationship with the city council this year. Councilor Whiting, you would yes, be thank it. you. Uh, well, first of all, you guys are volunteers, and I do want to thank you for, for coming out and having that passion. I think you guys need to know that and need to hear that quite a bit. You guys are uh, moving ahead with a lot of these projects, uh, doing our legwork, and, and I think you need to know that. Um, I will add one thing on that facade program. Um, I've been on that review committee in the past for the HPAC, and um, I've talked about it a little bit. I would like to see a little more weighting uh, on historic preservation projects because they do cost more, but they do add a lot more back. So, and I'm not going to get into a philosophical discussion on it, but you guys can talk <laughs> about it at another time. But as far as uh, looking ahead and giving you guys some guidance <coughs> from us, um, some projects we may need to do this joint meeting, I think. Not always. I think you guys are doing a pretty good job of moving ahead, but as far as giving you guys that overall picture, um, one of your things on here was the 101 corridor and city councils for longer than you guys have been on I think have been talking about the 101 corridor and what we can do with that and another part of it um, I can go back to the 80s you, were we talking about it then oh yeah okay uh, I'm sure because uh, I've heard about it for years and years and years so I think that should be 
continue to be in our focus. And right above that, you're talking about TIF and abatement, and we're us using that. Um, one thing, um, and I don't want to get into a philosophical discussion about <laughs> this one either, but to use TIF for redevelopment of certain areas that maybe maybe it's the one-on-one -on -one area, but not redevelopment <laughs> to the point where we're tearing out houses and totally going from scratch. But there's plenty of room within our one-on-one -on -one corridor that we could use TIF to redevelop properties that that are for sale or, or not developed or, or just uh, underutilized that will help people that may want may want redevelopment on their property. If I could then expand on that, that was actually <laughs> exactly the topic that came up and we actually asked staff, and I think in February, is Mr. Luke still here? In February, I think, is that when we're doing the, we're having a presentation? Yes, spring said it's going to be a couple of folks to okay. talk to you about what to get there next week and plan to do that. Right, and that was, we asked staff to put together a presentation for us to tell us what exactly <coughs> can the city use TIF and tax abatement for. And historically in Shakopee, it's been used for new development, right. and we wanted to just find out what options are there, and that's, you know, kind of along the same lines. And so that we can help recommend things to you and then the city council can act on it or not act on it. But it was more of an educational piece along those same lines. That was kind of what brought it up is we had kind of saying, well, okay, we've got a lot of properties for sale. Right. Does that present an opportunity for the city without the city getting involved in, like you say, tearing down buildings and houses, but helping a developer realize there's an advantage to if we pick out one of these properties. Um, multiple properties or a zone and mm -hmm. that adds to the developer coming in and saying hey this is already scheduled mm -hmm. for some uh, redevelopment uh, packages so uh, that's my input on that <coughs> um, and I want to hit one more thing and then I'll let somebody else talk uh, the 69 169 I think is is uh, is out there it's prime it's huge it's also township so uh, that annexation part, the, the guiding of that, the developing of that, that uh, there's a committee that uh, Councillor Lehman sits on that's working with the townships on that. But I think that's going to be important and where, where we want to see that area to go, working with the property owners to um, move them along in the process too. So I think those are some big picture items. Mm -hmm. We have that property tentatively drawn in our land use maps. Yeah, it's going to be, I don't think that's going to be the first item that you sh you're going to be taking up. No. Because that, I think that's going to be a little bit further out than most people think. Which one's that? Sorry? Uh, 69, 69, 69. Oh, sure. And, and that one, yeah. I think the interchange yeah. is going to come, right. you know, it's going to come pretty quick. But, and maybe that might spur right. more to it. But from the utility standpoint, it's ex extremely expensive. It, it comes from one direction over. And to leapfrog the utilities is going to be extremely expensive in my opinion. So what is one of the first things that you'd want them to start looking at uh, well, the for the EDAC? Well, bridge, I think, is going to be moving forward, and the impacts to all the businesses down here. Uh, it, it, just so we know, everybody knows, it is <coughs> moving forward. They are uh, so letting the project this spring for it to be right. hopefully started in the fall of um, next year. 14. 14. Started in the fall of 2014? The completed in 14 started completed 14 yes but remember the, the legislature's in session so all you can do is cross your fingers and the the, the money is that's yeah. supposedly <laughs> secure we'll see if that can stick with that it's in a lockbox it's in a lockbox it's going to be some hurdles I, and I just had a, <coughs> had a two hour conversation on that with May 16th is but it will probably be a three to two year project but Thank you. And it looks like a four-lane project, yep. and it, there will be a time of closure in that process. I had a two-hour meeting with uh, Beard and Pratt just on that topic, well, in 169, too, um, two Sundays ago, and we talked this speci specifically about the funding of that, how that funding was uh, allocated by Senator Roebling, the, the last, the late Roebling, and... Uh, Shifting on the road. <laughs> She's not, She's not, not the Former latest. Senator Roebling. Former, yeah, former yes. Senator. <laughs> Shifting of the road and, and keeping it open on one side, and then but there is going to be a, a, a period of time where it's going to be closed completely. 
Now, is it uh, continuous? We were under the impression that it might be a couple days here, a couple days there, a yeah. couple days here, weekends there. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to run across a period of a couple of weeks probably. Okay. It, and that's something we'd certainly want to be aware yeah. of yeah. before it comes up. Well, oh. and, I, and I'd say, and more importantly, too, what I'd like to hear from, from council on that is, do you want to say, obviously we've got Springstead coming in here. They'll give us some opportunities on, on, on uh, the, the TIF for, for redevelopment of properties. Uh, do you want us to focus on that as identifying some areas that might be eligible to use TIF for redevelopment that could improve the, the face as you enter Shockley from that direction and start moving east down that corridor? Uh, is that a high priority is what you're telling us? Why not west also? All right, and, and also west for that matter. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, but but uh, is that what you're saying, Council Lehman? It's not my priority to use uh, tax tax dollars to uh, take people's property away, though. No. Okay. Mm. But as far as then, what do you want us to look at it as far as that? Uh, How do you well, hold on just Wait. a second. I'm just going to make sure that we're very clear. No one is, when we say the word redevelopment, no one is talking at all about taking property away. No one is no. talking about eminent domain. That is not okay. what we're talking about at all. So and that's that we're not, we've very clear on that. that. But it could happen. Exactly. It could happen if Stop. council decided to do that, but that's not what we put it out there. We're talking how, about. how we propose, how we talked about it at our EDAC meeting was: can we? And I posed the question to Mr. Lee: Can the city identify a property or a block or whatever it might be? Call it a, a block of what's the property that we talked about down on 101? I don't know the address of it. The old where Yerusso's uh, Yeah, yeah. Okay. block, for example. Could the city designate that block for TIF tax abatement or whatever to incentivize a private developer to come in? Because right now nobody wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. And try and the city shouldn't buy it. We agree. That's not what we're talking about. I don't think no. we've ever discussed Why? that. Well, we just haven't but discussed you, it. Yeah, not discussed it but yeah. You set up a tax increment financing right. district. Right. And there'll be a number of parcels within that. Right. Within and that that's district, what we. Or corridor in this, in this case. Um, going back to your earlier question, you know, how, how do you foresee us working together? Or work, I think you kind of asked, you know, what do you want from us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, in a nutshell, um, we, we want your, we want you know, your expertise. We, the, with the economy, you know, finally slowly coming around now. And a couple of years ago, I think it was three years ago now, when we sort of reinstituted the EDAC and. and got you know the stars you know the a team going here um is you know was the first step the second step is starting to um free up some money in the in the levy to support some long-range goals in your case the most important to you would be the uh, economic development coordinator that we're looking to hire um we you know we're, we're always trying to look 10 20 years down the road but really what we're hoping for is with you and in your new group to really give us some more shorter three five year mm -hmm. kinds of ideas to help us really kind of get that whole thing kicked off the the thing that you need to understand though is that you know you you all i think most of you come from business backgrounds and are used to things happening on typical business timetables. <laughs> You're going to be really, really frustrated if you expect that to be the case with any kind of government, even local government. We're at this bottom level of the, the ladder. We're able to be a little bit more nimble and flexible, but it's still government. And it's, you know, it just kind of think to yourself, well, how long would it take if this were a business and then double or triple it? It um, actually uh, is probably a bigger number than that. But that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 but, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for your... That's not a shot at staff, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> that's just government. That's just the way... The, the, By it's design, people it's need to have an opportunity by to watch, see yeah, what happens. No, it's just, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I don't know that I'd really want it any other way when it... You know, because... In a business, you've got a, a much smaller entity you're looking at, and you make decisions, and you live or die with the results of the decisions you made. Whereas, you know, here we're talking about an entire city, and you know, we're always supposed to be looking out for the best interests of the entire city, not just one little aspect of it. So it, it's, you know, it's 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 a 
going to be frustrating at times for you, just as it is for us almost always. Um, but please don't let it get you so frustrated that you just throw up your hands and say, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, just the fact that we're looking at this uh, bridge going across the river bottoms and we've only been discussing that for five or ten years. And right. I, I'm, I'm really kind of flabbergasted that we might actually have a bid letting it, you know, in 2014 on it. Uh, usually, you know, to my thinking, it would be, I would have been happy if it was ten years out. So this is, you know, great news for as far as, you know, my slow government thinking kind of thing goes. Um. I, I was going to say, I, I think at least initially based upon the conversations here, um, the 101 corridor seems like it's a priority as a result of, you, you said for since the 80s, it's been a topic of discussion yeah. for that. Well, back when... I was, back in the 80s, I was on the downtown, ad hoc downtown redevelopment committee. Yeah. We were talking about where was, should the new bridge be built and how should the bypass be, you know, situated and where. And, and um, but that was a 10-year process be from the time we first got it organized to the time actually dirt started getting moved. Um, and I... I think something similar to what the city did back then might work in this situation with the 101 corridor, um, form a, a special ad hoc committee, hopefully get you know a, a good representation of business and property owners along the corridor to be part of it, you know, meeting once a month or so to, and start identifying what they see as needs and wants and to bring input as well as with your group and, and the engineering and right and with this new economic coordinator maybe we'll have some opportunity to um, you know go you know come up with an idea this might be you know a good thing to fit along this particular part of that corridor and, and go out and maybe start knocking on some doors and see if we can bring in some outside money to help fund it right Councilor Sherman um, Go ahead. What I'm pleased to see on this list and I think is important and where potentially things could happen more quickly is the focus on some of the vacant facilities, um, properties throughout the city, like the Kmart property, former Kmart properties that you mentioned, right. um, that that focus and determining how to market those properties, how to kind of position those, um, I think is a, a great <coughs> endeavor and could um, bring along something happening more quickly than when we're talking about the construction of a bridge. So I'm happy to see that on here, and I think that would be worth the effort. I'm going to, Mary, I'm going to try to go a little bit further on this vision thing for these guys. When when Scott Kelly had, had the workshop with the city a few years back and we talked about the transportation model, so First Avenue, the river crossing, and Marshall Road being the north-south to 282 and so on and so forth, the issue that I kept making at the time, which finally landed on somebody's <coughs> desk, was the uh, frequency of trains on Marshall Road and how it's going to clog up that north, south, and first avenue corridor. Okay, you probably remember that conversation. Yes, I do. Um, and at that time, Scott County studied that and decided that there's some merit to using all avenues possible. So that put this leg of first avenue up to 169 <coughs> into reconstruction the interchange at 69 and now the traffic volumes are warranting doing something with 101 bridge so we know we have this interchange which is eventually going to drive development into the township at that interchange we know we have a new road right here just can't get to it very well with the access we have at 169, which is going to be fixed shortly. And we don't have the capacity to get across the river. So once them two elements are fixed, <coughs> we're totally missing this over here. If you drive that corridor and come across the river and go up to 69, that whole side isn't, uh, I'm trying to think of how Mr. Leak would describe that, underutilized in some areas maybe? Would that be adequate? <laughs> um, and I, I think we're missing that because in the traffic model, 
the car, the people like to, to pick their own routes. And if there's trains over here and they can't get through Marshall to make that through Shakopee South, according to the models, they're going to make a free right and get right up to the interchange at 169, shoot over, shoot south. So that is going to have an impact on that whole area. It's going to, it's probably going to drive the township annexation issue a little more with the access, and it's going to drive this area down here on this end. Mm -hmm. The traffic will be there, but the businesses won't be there to support it, but the traffic will be there to support the business. So what do you see that as being? What, what do you... I mean, are you saying that there should be retail there? Are you saying you there should be jobs there? What do you What do you think? That's a good question. That's uh, that's probably a good question for our city planner, who has a lot more experience in that than I do. Um, but I think that's the question we've been asking: is what is yeah. that? Because we've talked about retail, <coughs> and mm -hmm. we, we vision it as most likely a retail area to draw traffic down, because we tend to agree that the traffic that's going there is drive-through traffic, right? I, I think on the interchange was so light industrial i think there was some talk on on this on the opposite side of 69 as some higher end housing along the bluffs and stuff the along overlooking the river if mr leak nice please nice. correct me if i'm wrong but um and then we, you know you're going to have to buffer from rar maybe some industrial mm -hmm. uses along there working up towards no when you say these the these top. were these were the kind of some of the concept drawings that were thrown out during the 101, the county's project a couple of years ago, I think, right? Is uh, that what you're... Well, we kind of went through this in our comp plan updates a few okay. times. Okay. And then didn't, but didn't it come up during <coughs> that process too? There was some discussion and maybe yeah. some, I think I remember seeing some of the plans had Access concept drawings and, and accesses and, and things like yeah. that. But I think there's also another problem or another uh, topic actually, is I, I think some of those areas don't have any sewer service. Uh, yeah. And I think we discussed that and, and but, you know, really, it's kind of like building the, you know, the baseball field and they'll come. If you don't have a sewer service, it's pretty hard, which is why we were so excited tonight when, you, when the 101 sewer thing got taken care of. But there, many of those areas have no sewer service at this point in time. Um, and so, but I, I think it, it has to be absolutely looked at, and I think we, we have been making it a, a conversation. But it's going to ultimately get back to at some point sewer service and, and I don't so know. let's let mr. Lee go up here real quick just three things for you to keep in mind as you discuss that area in the future uh, one is that there was significant retail at the Shakopee Town Square Mall that certainly dwindled over the years and what I've experienced here on the west end of Shakopee is that a lot of retailers don't look at it because they can't see even into the future, households surrounding their significant retail businesses. So while in the current comprehensive plan you see some area that we've shown for retail, two things about it. It's in the township as was noted, so the city doesn't have land use jurisdiction. And based on that factor that, that we've encountered over the last decade and a half, I'm not sure it's the right location for retail. Keep in mind also the work that was done largely by private sector folks along with our scale team that looked at that area and thought it was a better area for logistics, warehousing, and those kinds of uses because of its access to a divided four-lane roadway. So those are some of the things that you are dealing with in that location that might counterindicate retail in that location unless you can figure out a way to put a whole lot more rooftops there. And that might be somewhat difficult. Thank you. So a couple things I would like to um, take and from council create a couple action items, I suppose, for lack of a better term. Um, one thing that I think we can take from the conversation is talking about uh, the 101 corridor. And I think we all um, have heavy investment in seeing the 101 corridor yeah. a vision for the area and what we can do um, to create some things happening now to incentivize private development um, and things going on there um, is that fair from a council standpoint mm -hmm. um, but and then taking that up one level further is I would like to, for you to identify I don't know what the right number is <coughs> four or five 
areas of town that um, we need to be focusing on. And maybe, and that's not all right away, um, but look at from your guys' perspective, prioritize a list of what we need to be looking at. Um, so an, number one on those, or it could be number one would be something like 101 corridor. Something that I would like to see is look at um, Canterbury Road from Valley Fair to 169 to uh, Mystic Lake um, as retail and entertainment because I don't think that we as a city have really um, harnessed the ability to pull in retail and entertainment for that area and see if there are ways that we can look at that area and that goes along with what Councilor Sherman was talking about with uh, the, we'll call it the late Kmart distribution center the third came <laughs> um the third came in our discussion there we go <laughs> and um and for that um but identify projects like that that are prioritized as to what we need to look at because we've obviously got finite amount of time and a finite amount of resources to be able to do things um but that's that's one thing that i would like um <coughs> you guys to work on and then the second thing that I'd really like you to work on is you've started this already uh, with Mr. Leak and it will continue uh, with the new economic development position, um, but a um, economic development process for the city of Shakopee. I think that the way we, um, the way we sell ourselves in the marketplace is going into the future, we won't be able to put tax abatement and TIF and all these kinds of things into projects um, as we are right now moving into the future is to get as much going as we have possibility. So I think that if as these projects are moving now and we're starting to have traction on bringing jobs, we need to have a concrete process that we can show to developers that you will, this is the process you follow, this is how it will um, lay out as your project moves forward because one big thing that they want is predictability. They want to understand the process and they want to know what's going on um, and have that communicated. So with the new position, I would like you guys to work um, with them to continue that process into the future. So it's, those are my two big things. Um, is that, what else do you guys have to add to that from a council I, side? I think, you know, I had, circled here uh, the Kmart distribution here drove by it today and uh, if this Emerson project goes through that I mean 101 I think would be the first <coughs> priority but that might be something we could look at if it doesn't get turned over and, well know, I think that distribution center own. has immediacy to it that mm -hmm. I mean I'd, if it for me that would be my first first one um, because it's it's empty now and no, um, if we want it to be, if we want it to be something else, in the next phase, now was the time before it gets. Which would mean zoning and all sorts of planning. And could changing. yeah, the, the I, warehouse on eighty three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, could, it has potential. Point, point of history. That was the Shakopee's first tax increment financing mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's next. Yeah. And then of course the sixty nine one sixty nine, but that has so many strings attached and <laughs> other things but but I right. think I think the interchange and this bridge are gonna force that mm -hmm. and they very yeah and we and you know we we've oftentimes thought uh, if we can just get a tree planted someplace on the 101 corridor or a couple of critical trees planted you know the rest of the forest will fill in and in speaking to the to the 101 corridor issue you know we need one significant tree and I think everybody kind of knows where it needs to go at some point in time and uh, I'd like to see in this next year a way to make that happen with the new position with the person out there promoting it you, you know it's the ideal time when you have a bridge coming in you got a time where there's going to be a huge boom and it's a chance for somebody to take a real good advantage of a situation from a business standpoint the Kmart Development Center, it's interesting that you bring up to have it a, you know, a entertainment center, retail center. It would be fascinating to watch Canterbury be kind of become that and it, uh, uh, as such. And I think, 
I don't know what all the members think on the EDAC, but I think probably you would have a pretty good support in regards to that. Um, Is there parking? Well, you know, I don't know, but it's a, it it's an empty slate right now. It's it's whatever it can be. Well, so. one of, with that building, one of the things we talked about at a meeting, I think in our December meeting, was Mr. Leak talked about the fact that that's going to be that may be very tough to sell because of the way it's built and the demands for warehouse spacing now as opposed to the way that building was constructed. And so that may, over the next year, we may see that there's some opportunity for another use for that property because the current building may not be as desirable. Um, does anybody know uh, how many acres that the site is? Michael? Let's not get into that, okay. that <laughs> level <laughs> of detail that's right now. We, it's, it's just something that we can work on. something we can look at, yeah. Well, it yeah. sounds to me like we're hearing that at least you guys, from a general standpoint, the goals list is a good start. And you've kind of, I think, given us a at least a direction on which ones to start with. But, um, And I think you're right, Mr. Lehman. There's a lot of this stuff that we've already kind of, since even since December we made this list, we can check off the economic development coordinator position. We're going to have that discussion next. I mean, that's, okay, that's off the list. Some of these things have already kind of been in, in the works. So. Right. I always recall discussions um, with EDAC talking about uh, need for bridge loans, availability for bridge loans for yep. financing. Yeah, financing. And yeah, then I don't see it on this list. Does that become less of an We haven't thing? had an issue uh, involving that for <coughs> it's been a while. That's right, two years, three years. I don't know. It's been a long time where that has we been discussed. Yeah, the startup loan program, I think, is kind of what we, we just wanted to know what's available and what type of programs could there be. I mean, a, there, a lot of us haven't been on the commission long enough to remember. I know that was discussed a couple of years ago, but yeah. most of us, I think only two of you, I think right. George and Paul were the only ones around then. So we did ask staff to kind of, in 2013, just give us some information on what <coughs> possible because we don't really know. Mm. My family bought a malt shop when we're, you know, way back when. And um, one of the things we ran into is once you buy a business, you're subjected to all the new regulations that have happened since then. One of the things we had to add in is grease traps and stuff like that. When we bought the business, we weren't expecting these additional costs. So one of the things that we talked about with this startup loan program is, you know, buying a business or starting a business, you know, these unexpected costs that, like you said, that, you know, they have to qualify, but, you know, they weren't expecting these. They need to get over this hurdle so they can get the business going and eventually get all that covered. So that was one of the reasons why we're considering this proposal. If somebody's starting a new business compared mm -hmm. to somebody that's moving a business into Shakopee, mm -hmm. A new business should almost we should almost have a something like Project Gate slash SBA type program where they actually sit down with you, go over your business plan, and you guys have utilized Minnesota School of Business mm -hmm. in the past, and that might be a good opportunity to put something together with them to, to do that, to where you take a new prospective business owner and sit them down and say, mm -hmm. you know, here's let's go through your plan here and and really make sure you know what you're getting into and that you're covering all your all your bases here. I, I happen to do it through Project Gate, <coughs> uh, which is a federal program. Didn't get no money or anything, but they sure woke me up to a lot of different things. Great program. Um, hard to come by. These programs are very hard to come by. Just to, just to sit That's down and have somebody with that experience mm -hmm. to talk A great to. deal of our discussion about the startup loan program and the mentoring program was just that sometimes even having someone to vet your business plan or to give you some ideas about the regulations that you don't know about, right. whether it's people qualified in those industries or uh, business business people from the community or people from the School of Business. There are a lot of different opportunities, I think, to make this a really business-friendly environment here. And some of those things, it's just hands-on conversations sometimes. Burnsville actually has a group called SCORE that does that. It's like mm -hmm. five or six CEOs of big companies that sit down mm -hmm. and offer their, donate their time mm -hmm. that want to sit down mm -hmm. with each other's mm -hmm. business plan. Good idea. It's a great thing. So it's, it's almost... They all kind of go together. It's almost <coughs> something that Shakopee needs to consider getting itself into. Mm -hmm. 
And even just from the marketing perspective, it shows not only that we're interested in new businesses, but we actually want to help new businesses do very well here and stay here. Mm -hmm. One thing that brings up a very good point that we've kind of talked around for the last few years with economic development in Shakopee is marketing and spending money on marketing for the city. I personally have zero dollars, zero desire whatsoever to spend any money on marketing um, for the city. What does council think about that? Um, do we want to have a marketing program for the city? Do we want to have spend money advertising for Shakopee? What do you guys think? That's true. Um, the only thing that comes to mind for me is potentially looking at how do we do a better job in terms of um, wayfinding through the city and branding through the city. I mean, we worked on the one leg of 101 and we have brand new streetlight fixtures that have these great sign holders on them that we're not utilizing. Um, and, and also we've had a lot of discussion over the years in terms of um, 169 and 101 and how are we directing mm -hmm. people through the city that I think those are a couple of opportunities mm -hmm. that are they're not technically marketing but yet right. they are in a way um, that that would be where I would recommend focusing versus like blasting out and kind of marketing right. but just kind of cleaning up um, how that impression is when you drive through the city and um, how are we presenting ourselves in that way, which is a, it's marketing, it's just a different kind. We had a discussion actually about, <coughs> at our last meeting, about highway signage because of mm -hmm. that very issue. And one of the things we asked staff to do was to keep us in the loop as the 169-69 interchange goes in, because we talked about how when you come south on 169, you know, it says Shakopee, you go off to the right and you take mm -hmm. 101. Well, most of Shakopee now t stays to the left right. and follows the sign of Mankato, right? right. So it's really kind of a misleading signage issue, and obviously that's outside of anything any of us in this room can do, but if we get involved in that discussion before MnDOT spends the money and puts the sign up mm -hmm. down at 169.69 when they do that, <coughs> maybe we can do something like that that helps impact the businesses in 101 or wherever it might be. And so that's definitely something that I think as a group we've, we're very, uh, that was Paul brought that up and we had a pretty good discussion on it. Yes, Layman. I agree with you, but to really get it done, you need to direct Bruce's staff after midnight to just go out there and put them up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a done. lot easier. <laughs> we'll keep uh, that in mind. As as All right. As far as marketing Shakopee, Mr. Albinson, would you give us just a couple minutes of your time? <laughs> Sorry. John Albinson marketed Shakopee for many years uh, for Valley Green Industrial Park out in Shakopee. And it would be great to hear from his own how, how he did that with very little assistance from the city because he was very successful at it. Uh, probably a lot of things went into it. The location went into it. Um, he knew how to sell the certain features of Shakopee at that time period. We need to, we need to know how to, how to do that <coughs> in this time period. And uh, well, I, I think you're going to see one of the, uh, one of the benefits, I'm, I'm sorry, but for the, for the position that is being considered and, and uh, I guess it's been approved or whatever, but um, that is how we see that that, I mean, that's what the person's going to, without spending money so much <coughs> in marketing, that person's going to coordinate all the, they're going to bring together all the loose ends as far as available properties and things like this and what businesses are looking for and what the city of Shakopee is looking for. Like if we're looking for 101, you know, redevelopment or a tree to be planted on 101, they'll understand that that's a priority and they'll understand, you know, what kind of things that perhaps, you know, the council sees as, you know, the kind of business that they want there or the kind of redevelopment and they'll <coughs> be able to take it to. So it is kind of a marketing concept as well as bringing everything under one roof where you can then one-stop shop, which has been a big thing. So. And I'm going to interject and add, um, yeah, driving bu driving through Shakopee is great, but a lot of the people that are considering moving businesses here aren't driving through Shakopee right away. And I can guarantee you 100% that one of the things they're going to look at is the website. Mm -hmm. And next week, the um, Shakopee has a um, website task force that will be meeting to for further development of the website. Yep. So 
use that Huge. big time I was say, in terms because, of like I said, 100%. Your, yeah. right. so that's your marketing. Door, that, and that, that and the economic development director position right. is all so you really need. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that is something that, I mean, you were, I mean, we were very involved in that website redo, or at least the concept of it, for quite a while. So uh, you're absolutely right. Hey, we spent all these money on signs, and then we could have just done the website. Well, there you are. Mr. Morris. I think those are good non-traditional marketing approaches to look at. You could throw dollars into the air, you know, trying to promote, come look at Shockby, come look at Shockby. But if you can't deliver on service of the website or service of that economic developer coordinator position who will hopefully um, hold the hands of prospective businesses, show them good service, deliver timely responses, and prove that Shockby is an easy city to work with when you're looking at expanding, uh, relocating a business here, if you're not backing it up with anything. I think you... We've got the fundamentals. Yeah, you know, the traditional marketing isn't going to get you anywhere when they stumble on the website or don't have that economic development development position within the city. Right. Um, Mayor, okay, I, I think one, one, hold on just a second. Um, we're just going to take a couple more minutes here. Um, I'll let you finish that thought, and then we're going to kind of go around the table and see if there's any last thoughts people have and um then hit council again and begin council layman i'll do mine as a last thought well you can get start <laughs> um, well my last thought is that we can't lose sight of the fact that whenever we spend money on abatement or tiff or this or that or the other thing that money has to be paid for by somebody i mean it's easy to do a tax abatement to get a business here but ultimately somebody's going to pay for that and that means that the existing businesses and the existing households are going to foot that bill, or the future ones in this case of some of them that go out nine years or 15 years. So with that being said, it's not, it's easy to do it when you're not thinking about the impacts on those that are currently here or going to be here shortly, because like I said, somebody is going to pay for it. And the question then becomes, how much can you load on to them until they start detracting from your consumer base. Now you're taking their disposable income away for them to go shopping at the mall you just built, but they can't afford to shop there because they're paying for the incentives that you've given to get them all there. So you have to weigh this all out and, and make sure that when you do put a burden on somebody else's back, <coughs> that the burden is justified and, and it's, a low enough burden that it's not harmful. Do you follow that? Because it's too easy to, 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 to think that all of these things that we do don't have impact on others when they do. It's, there is no free money. We're not, we're not the federal government or we just print it. So that's my last thought. Mr. Sherman. Um, I just want to make sure that it, that we've hit on appropriately the prioritization of the things that you've got on your list and if there needs to be further discussion on that and um, in, in your next meeting or just want to make sure that you feel like you have enough from us here tonight. Um, any feedback on that <laughs> in terms of how to prioritize? I mean, I feel like, w I think part of what we wanted when we came here was what to present these general ideas and see what you guys thought of it. I mean, if you, told us, well, <coughs> seven of these 11 are totally crazy. We'd have to go back to the drawing board, and it feels like we're not getting that, that we're getting, okay, we're kind of, we're hitting on some of the topics that you guys want to see us hit on, maybe not quite in the same direction, but that'll all sort itself out later on. But from a topic standpoint, I don't know, it seems like we've got some yeah, good I ones think, to start Yeah, I think with. we have a pretty good, I mean, you get, a, you get a pulse of the room, what people want, and I think we have a pretty good idea. Okay, good. And the second thing is, um, Ms. Wilson, maybe uh, through the interview process, potential candidates might need to watch this video and see the great expectations <laughs> of <laughs> what we have in mind for this role. Um, I just want to be cautionary around that, that this will just be one individual. And yes, we're going to hire a very talented and skilled person, but they're a piece of the puzzle. And to make sure that we find a way to properly integrate them and clarify their role, which we'll get to in a minute. But mm -hmm. there seems to be great expectations around the room, which I think is good that we're all very excited about it but um to be realistic as well that it'll be one person helping us out <laughs> exactly kevin i guess i'd like the only thing i'd like to close with is if throughout 
any my time on the EDAC, it'd be nice if if any one of the council members has an idea that you feel free to use our group as a sounding board. We'll kick it around. I mean, if you come up with, you, you think of a, <coughs> I'm going to use an example that's going to draw laughter, but a Viking stadium um, <laughs> as just one kind of extreme example. But if you have an idea of something that you think might be an idea for economic development, I mean, as a group, we're really open to taking those ideas and kind of <coughs> just going through them and seeing if they make sense. And hopefully part of this meeting is to encourage whether as a group or as individual counselors, feel free to th shoot us ideas to kick around because sometimes we we look for ideas. That's what happens. I actually very much echo Kevin's thoughts. That's kind of what I was thinking is, is uh, continue to interact with us and bounce things back and forth and so we can make this a nice collaborative process. You've got a lot of great resources here and uh, obviously we're very interested in helping and participating. I think we got great feedback on our original goals that we set out here, which is very nice to point out that we're all fairly well in alignment. Um, but um, obviously no, have to temper our expectations and we are business people who want everything done yesterday, but <laughs> we do realize we're working with government. But um, I think that overall we have some fairly good direction going forward. Uh, I just wanna say uh, again, thank you guys for your <coughs> work and everything and uh, I think next year in the budget we're going to double your pay <laughs> so, um, but I do want to touch on one thing that we didn't talk about real quick is uh, marketing and develop how do you develop that post-secondary uh, education unit that might be at the uh, the old old Kmart out there and, and that that's very interesting I think uh, that could be a uh, that would be a whole different marketing I think <coughs> that's all I want to say on that I don't know what you're, I don't know the what you're saying. The post-secondary, they had an idea of uh, using the old Kmart, the old Town Square Mall, oh, that area, the as post-secondary kind of, and how you how you uh, develop that, how you um, market that to potential schools and things, that's a whole different. Build on what's already there. Yeah, I, I, I think it'd be interesting. I think it'd be a, uh, maybe a good, good way to utilize that area. Um, and to touch on <coughs> the, the increment uh, part of that, it, it, I think if we, if we're only getting the little bit of tax money that that uh, these rundown buildings or vacant buildings are making, and we can get so much more by developing that property, I don't think we're burdening the taxpayers that short period of time because we're actually putting people in there. We're we're, we're creating more value out of that property in the end. But I don't. I, I agree with you. You don't want to put it on the backs of people. But I think if you. <coughs> better than ha not having these properties developed. And if you take the tax money that you're getting off the building today and put it aside, then you're gonna have to raise your taxes to make it up. But we don't lose that that part of it. That's that's what I'm saying is we, we, we gain yeah. something in the take end. Take a right. district and then charge an added tax. Now you're making a business that's well, a district currently is gonna be, currently gonna pay an additional tax to have that tax used to take their property. The argument will be made <laughs> All right. Anyway, <laughs> Mr. Morris. That's all I had. Uh, the only additional thought I had was around the facade improvement program. Uh, we have three groups who are hearing feedback from those applicants, and I think it's just important to make sure that we note that as we go forward that so that we can collect it throughout the year and then make any applicable changes when we start the program again next year rather than do a one-time retrospective look in December. Perfect. Remember love? A um, couple things. I know you touched on that you'd like to see us work on three to five year ideas and stuff. Um, we have a really good group with a lot of great ideas that concentrate on those as well as even 20 year ideas and stuff. Um, there should be something in place where we have a list of here's what we're working on, we send it to you, you prioritize, get that back to us, so there is more of that relationship. Because as you can see from a lot of this, we're like, we're sending stuff up and maybe not feeling as much coming back down. So we're looking for that. And as touching on the 20 year and the sec post-secondary, one of the ideas we um, touched on was perhaps, you know, 20 years, get a medical college out by St. Francis. So you have those people who get graduate from there are now going to work at St. Francis. So you're keeping highly educated people in Shakopee in a, you know, it perpetuates itself. Um, I wanted to touch on the industrial, um, that 69 
you know, to 169. Shakopee is very well suited for all of Scott County. It has a lot of um, places for industrial that a lot of other cities can't provide for. Um, it produces more tax, um, lessening the tax for the residents and stuff like that. And I've seen in one of the cities I grew up with, they started with an industrial park. And what happened from that is it grew so big that they started building houses next to it because so many people were working there. And then because of those houses, you had you know, Kmarts and Walmarts and start, stuff start moving in. So you know, that corridor, you know, don't just think retail at this point because you know, that's throwing away one of Shakopee's resources there. And um, you also touched on you know, entertainment retail. Um, yeah, I know Canterbury would love to put in a hotel and all these other things in that area. And that could be your lunch pen, you know, the tree planted for that area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk to them, see what can we do to help them out on things like that. So um, those were my ideas. Thank you. George. Uh, mine are pretty simple. I'm, uh, I'd like to plant trees where the, tree, where the place needs it. And... Um, you know, I, I recognize that we have to, you know, be a little bit more patient at our uh, process. And uh, so, I, you know, I think we've actually, over the last three years that I've been involved with it, I think we've done a lot of things. I think we got a lot of stuff, you know, checked off. And I'm really excited about the direction that we're going right now. The group of people that we have on the committee is outstanding. They're very sharp. And uh, they all participate heavily which is wonderful. So um, as we uh, send things up, send them down, I think somebody else said that earlier, and it'll be good. So, Paul? Well, yeah, uh, top-down direction's great. More of that would be excellent. It's been three years I've been on this council. It's the first time we've done a joint meeting. Let's make sure it's not three years before we do another one. Mr. McNeil? I'm taking notes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Clay? I did my last thoughts first. <laughs> All right. Um, I think it's going to be a lot easier to have that bouncing back and forth when you have that staff person working yeah. both sides. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that's where most of the bouncing is going to occur from and not necessarily these. Um, but I think it, that once that happens and someone's focused on that uh, position, there will be a lot more um, ability to communicate back and forth. So. Um, my takeaways from the meeting are find places to plant trees, prioritize where we want to plant trees. I like the way you say that, George. And then how we're going to plant those trees, the process of how we're doing it. Um, I also want to make clear that when we're talking about Highway 1, one corridor, in my head, that includes the downtown. I don't know if everybody is assuming that. I just want to make sure that we mention the downtown as part of that corridor and how we make sure that the whole thing is successful. Um, all right, so moving on to um, put everything back here. Um, 10A3, uh, discussion of economic development staff position. Thank you, everybody, again, for your work and for being here to talk about all these things. I really appreciate it. This has been a good good do discussion. We, do we need to adjourn the EDAC? No, or? you're in on this one, and then we'll. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We've got gotcha. you. <laughs> I'm well aware of it. <laughs> Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the next item up for discussion is the staff position that has been budgeted for in the city's 2013 budget to focus specifically on economic development. There was a draft job description in your packet for tonight's meeting, um, and this job description was reviewed with the EDAC at their meeting last <coughs> week. and. Um, there's a quiz for those of you that are on the EDC of what changes I've made since you uh, looked at it last <laughs> week. It has been edited to take into account uh, the commission's uh, input. So the title we are looking at is Economic Development Coordinator. This would be a staff person in the administration department reporting directly to <coughs> the city administrator. A full-time position and exempt, except means it's a salaried position, not an hourly. Uh, the pay grade <coughs> that we have budgeted for is grade eight, um, which in 2013 means roughly 61 to 76 thousand dollars, so somewhere in there. Plus, 
the standard benefits package for a full-time city employee, medical and dental insurance, paid vacation and sick leave, uh, pension, and so forth. Next, we have a basic summary of the position, um, looking at the position being responsible for developing and implementing economic development programs for the city, uh, basically with three goals, business retention, expansion, and attraction, job growth, and tax base expansion. Um, and specifically calling out the number of relationships and interactions and communications that will be important to this position. Uh, the minimum qualifications that are proposed in the job description are a bachelor's degree in business, public administration, finance, economic development, marketing. We talked specifically with the EDAC last week about not narrowing that too much, that there aren't maybe a lot of people that go directly into college thinking this is what I want to do. But in fact, out in the real world, there are a variety of people coming at this from a variety of different directions that have the potential to be successful in the position. Um, a minimum of three to five years of related work experience. Again, um, related being fairly broadly defined, or at least an open mind going into the um, application review and interview process. Um, and then experience interacting with local government entities and knowledge of the municipal development process strongly desired. So that's something that would certainly allow the person hired to hit the ground running um, much more quickly um, than if they are fairly new to that process. The rest of the job description goes into what we call essential duties and responsibilities. I had not planned to read each one of these to you <laughs> at this hour, but I'd be happy to answer any questions um, you might have or suggestions or requests for changes. Questions from uh, council first. Uh, the only question I've got is, is this going to go through the <laughs> traditional, normal hiring process for who interviews and all that kind of stuff? Or are we going to try and involve <coughs> any um, like business leaders, brokers, anything, anybody like that in the interview process? Or how does that all work? I would say, I mean, my first step always after you approve a job description is to meet with the person that's going to be the supervisor for the position in this case, Mr. McNeil, and talk about how we ferret out the best possible candidate. You know, in the past, we've done interview panels that have been entirely made up of city staff people. Um, one of our common tricks is to borrow an expert in the field from another organization. So if we can find a neighboring city in the metropolitan area, that is viewed as doing this really, really well, we'll ask um, their um, economic development staff person to come sit in on the interviews with us and provide their expertise. Um, I think we'd also want to talk to DEED and or Greater, Minnesota, or Greater MSP mm -hmm. and see if they would have someone that would be completely outside of our area that would Perfect. be able to sit in. All right, yep. wonderful. So, and we share the same way on a, a variety of positions with other yeah. organizations, so. Any other questions? <coughs> All right. Um, and I need to go back to my notes here. Do you need a motion on this one? Once you are only acting as a city council, then we'll need a motion and a vote on this one to make it official. Uh, the idea was to have kind of any discussion that needed to happen now and then have you take a formal vote when you're back at the diet. Perfect. EDAC, have any yeah, how do you further? Answer? Yes. Uh, under the summary in the first sentence, I think you may want it to read economic development programs for the city with the goals of business retention, expansion, and attraction. Okay. It just says goal currently. And then for minimum qualifications, if you have marketing in there, I think it may be good to add a degree in communications as well. I think you'd find more college graduates with degrees in communications than even marketing. Very good. My only comments. Thank you, sir. Any others? Yeah. I, I would just add that um, <coughs> I think Ms. Wilson, you did a great job of kind of mm -hmm. taking some of our suggestions from last week and incorporating them into it. And I think it's it's a pretty solid description. Thank you. All right. Um, now we will pull out of our multiple meetings we've got going on all at the same time here. We need to adjourn. We need yes, to adjourn. So, 
For the EDAC, I believe I'm going to need a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Member Morris. A second? Second. Second by Member Youngs. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. President Clay? Then I will look for a motion to adjourn to Tuesday. When? I don't know the date here. February something. February. So moved. That's typically not the EDA. Okay. That would be the council. Okay. So, and you need to second. So it would be February 19th. Yep. Fe motion to adjourn to February 19th. I'll move to adjourn to February 19th. We don't need Mr. Yeah. Waiting, seconded by Mr. Lehman. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Our lawyer had a weird look on his face. I was going to see if he had something to nah, say. That's probably just gas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we adjourned. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all. Let's council just stay here and we'll get Jamie's stuff figured out. Yeah, that was poorly worded, sorry. Um, uh, B 10B1, approval of job description authorization to advertise for economic development coordinator. Oh, we lost him. Not Jamie one. Did we want to do that with the EDA or not? Not necessary. No. No, we don't. Uh, Advertising for the position, you mean? Yeah. No, we don't do that with the EDA. <coughs> so what we're looking Chris. For this will be need? a motion to adopt the job description and authorize. Okay, that's training. all we need? Yep. All right, thank you. So, and a motion to approve the job description, authorize staff to advertise, the coordinator. So moved. So seconded. Second by Councilor Clay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone, anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Now, 10 uh, C1, moratorium temporarily prohibiting land alterations in the city. Ordinance number 864. Sorry, we should have moved you up. That was kind of rude, but. Interesting. Here we are. Listening, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have everybody? Yeah, we're good. Oh, Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, I'm bringing to you this forward tonight um, as a temporary uh, moratorium on some land alteration activities that I wanted to discuss with you tonight and to give staff time to do some alterations to our Chapter 11 zoning cone that have to do with tree um, management requirements. And Mr. Thompson has helped me with this so he can help answer any questions that you might have. But um, we're bringing this tonight because we have struggled for the past couple of months, and it's hap there's been a few issues um, over the years, but the past couple of months it's come to our attention that um, the current ordinance that we have, which is 1160 subdivision 9, uh, which is our tree management regulations, is triggered only by development. Um, so if somebody does not have an active CUP building permit, fence permit, um, development coming in, there's no regulations on what they can and can't do to their woodlands that are, that are on their property. Um, so we have had, as you know, in September, um, there was some tree clear clearing that made the paper um, and had some issues with that. We've had another one over the weekend um, that has come to my attention and they moved quickly. So um, this is where Jim and I discussed that it, it, we know that our ordinance needs some revisions. Um, I have not been able to get to it. Um, I know that's my fault that I haven't been able to change this earlier, um, but now I know I need to get to it, and I was hoping our natural resources person could do it when they come on, but I think that um, we need to do something in the meantime until we get that person hired. So I do a thank you for approving the job description. We can get that out tomorrow. But um, So this will, because it's a zoning issue, um, we have, we're going to take it to the EAC. Uh, these matters would go to them first to talk about anyway, but then it does have to go to the Planning Commission before it comes back to you um, because of the ordinance or in the section of the city code that it's in. So temporarily we're asking that um, we put what's called a memorandum on prohibiting land alterations in the city. We defined land alterations as being um, any private or public infrastructure, or utility, installation, building construction, excavation, grading, clearing, filling, or any other earth change that will result in the alteration of land by more than one foot from the natural contour of the ground to any, uh, on any continuous 450 square foot of ground where significant trees are present. And we define significant trees as the exact 
same definition as it is in our current ordinance. It's just considered a tree in our current ordinance, um, but it's a deciduous tree measuring six inches at breast height um, or more, or a coniferous tree that's 12 feet or more in height. And then the other part of that is um, any cutting, removal, or killing of more than 10% of the significant trees on any parcel of land. <coughs> so it is triggered by a certain amount. It doesn't mean that if a homeowner wants to go out and remove one tree on their property, this doesn't prohibit that. Um, what if they only have one tree? That'd be more than 10%. <laughs> Depends where they're located. It does, yes, but it still does not prohibit that from being, we're talking about, um, and they have to be six inches or greater. So anything less than six inches could still be removed without ever having to come to CD, even when a development comes in. We don't inventory anything six inches or greater. Um, but this moratorium is would be placed only for 180 days. That would give staff time to look at our current ordinance to get some language in there. What we need to do um, is change, and I'm meeting with our, our DRC committee tomorrow morning, which is our development review committee of staff. Um, just the very first part of this basically says that these standards shall apply to any development on any parcel of land containing a tree or for which, and then has lists what will trigger it. So what we need to look at is what other cities do to trigger um, these type of reviews, which would be that 10% or more of significant tree loss would trigger. So for instance, what happened in September on the property, the I-State property, is knowing that they were going to remove more than 10% of that land, that would trigger our true management requirements, they do the inventory, have to do a replacement, and the replacement at that time will be discussed, that's what we have to discuss, is whether it will be right away or when a development happens, but either way they'd have some um, responsibility to put something back on that property in the future. Um, so this 180 days just buys us time. Now in that 180 days, as we say in the exemption of four, number four, um, is that this does not prohibit anybody that's coming in with a development um, because a development does trigger our current ordinance, so then they would be have to do the tree management regulations. Um, same thing with anybody pulling a grading permit or a building permit or a fence permit. They can come in and do that, and then they, it would trigger our current ordinance, and we'd go through the process, and they would be able to do it as scheduled. Um, the only thing this doesn't allow is for someone to go out and just remove trees that's 10% or more of their property at this point well, during this 180 days without getting approval from the city. Mr. Thompson, did I explain that correctly? So I'll answer any questions that you might have. Councilor Sherman. I guess the main question I have is then how do we communicate this so that people are aware of it and what it triggers? Um, well, we would have to publish it because it's a temporary ordinance. It would have to be published like all other ordinances, but we would try to get um, you know, anybody that I know of that might be thinking of any tree removal on their property that doesn't have a development coming in or would be subject to development, um, I could send them this information up front so they have it, um, and then just trying to get the word out also through planning department if they have anybody that's looking and having questions with their permits, getting it out that way. Um, I plan on moving on this as quickly as possible. I plan on taking this to the EAC on the uh, February meeting. Um, we're looking at the date right now. As of right now, we're still planning on the regular meeting date of the 13th, but um, I'm waiting to hear back from one, one more person on the EAC to check on that date. But it would go to the EAC, and then I don't know when the next planning meeting would be, but it would go to the one following that EAC meeting and then come back to you. So I want to get it done before that 180 days, if possible. And isn't it the case that most of the times that these have been happening, they've contacted us first to see if we have anything that stops it from happening, and then we yes. would have a mechanism that we could use at that point? Um, I think is the way most of them have worked out. Is that yeah, accurate or no? These, <coughs> these current two, that the I-State property and the one that happened this weekend, yes, I was contacted by both and asking um, with the I-State, they ask if they farm the property if there's anything that triggered the tree management and at that time. There wasn't. There wasn't. So it's it's current Councilor Lehman. How do we uh, make sure, A, we don't violate state law and then B, that we don't violate property owner rights? <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I'm not state law. What any particular state law? Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> my understanding was uh, was these folks out here that wanted to cut the trees down and put in plantings, uh, uh, farm plantings type stuff that they're allowed to do that under state law. But that's that's true. There's nothing that prevents it under state law. These are all local regulations, and some not all cities 
uh, you may decide that when the um, criminal office comes back, that you may not even want to regulate this. This is completely up to up to you. Mo most of these, well, a lot of these regulate um, tree removal, just like Shakopee does, through the tree management, through a development plan, and not through uh, land alteration. But that's that's a decision you can make when it comes back does to you. Does this come under the powers of uh, police power? Yes, the city has the authority to do this, just like you have the authority to do a tree management plan that you have now. That's not covered or in state law. Zoning, either. Uh, or zoning, or residential right. or commercial. It's yeah, has nothing to do with police. It's just and the second question with respect to property owners, right? This is going to temporarily prevent property owners from doing something on their property. Well, uh, could, that's true. It could potentially permanently stop them from doing something with their. If property. you adopt the permanent ordinance, that's true. Yeah. It regulates it. That's true, but that that'll be a council decision. When it comes back to you for a permanent yes. ordinance, <coughs> anything major of a economic significance to a property owner would be done usually through development, right. which would trigger our ordinance. Yeah. Then they want to take them down to build whatever they're building, and then put them wherever they're. I was a little it. concerned about it being so broad. I, I was wondering, and it's would be helpful to put in a further caveat that it applies to parcels of one acre in size or larger but or yep. contiguous regardless of ownership parcels of one totaling one acre or larger I'm spamming I, I was thinking about that when you made your other comment council we could we could clearly add to this a, a provision that says it only applies to, I, I would say the parcel is greater in, than one acre in size. Mm -hmm. That would uh, be fine. From a staff perspective, that, yeah. Yes. So you wouldn't have the issue of the garage being added or right. something like that. Add some clarity to it and right. it doesn't stop right. ac economic activity that could be happening. Right. Mm -hmm. and you want to build a garage and doesn't want to touch it, oh. well, that doesn't get scraped right. off. Right. Doesn't uh, my concern is a little broader with the tree management uh, policy and, and that in one one parcel, and I spoke to staff about it today, it, it's so thick with trees that in the replacement of the trees, it would be, be cost prohibitive to businesses to develop. And it would be also, uh, you couldn't develop it because you'd have to put too many trees back in. Right. So I think that needs to be looked at it in, in uh, that respect. And that was an uh, old tree farm, and that was agricultural trees. So um, they're not natural trees. And so maybe there can be some <coughs> distinction between natural trees and trees that were planted for agricultural use because that would just prohibit development on that one parcel. Are you saying in this temporary ordinance? No, or are you saying when it comes back to us, back to us and the, and okay. back to us. So yeah, this, this I understand. Councilor Layman. Council Whiting, we actually had that discussion years ago when we created this wood, woodland management plan because in the R1C area of Shakopee, old Shakopee, our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. the uh, plan at the, the first draft was to have, if you took one tree down, you ended up replacing it with three. Mm -hmm. And the problem that I had with that at the time, and I, and I believe the current policy exempts R1C because of that reason. And, and the, the problem is, is that, let's you take my lot, for example, in the front, you got a sewer line coming up. You got a gas line coming up next to the house. You got the house footprint. You got the garage footprint in the back. You got a power line overhead going from kitty corner from the edge of the property to the house, and then you got an underground one going the opposite direction to the phone line. There's nowhere to put the tree, right. the tree trees, and, and you know they had two on the boulevard, which were the city trees, and one in the back. Well, lost this one in the storm. I replaced it myself. One up here on my property, off the city easement. Put one in the back up here. Um, but it's really limited in the old area. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't meet the requirement if you wanted to without screwing up some utility somehow. Mm -hmm. In small oh. lots, yeah. I totally understand with all the trees I have on my property there, my little postage stamp. So, um, Any other questions? No. All right, I will uh, entertain a motion from someone, Councilor Sherman. I will make a motion to adopt ordinance number 864, an interim ordinance of the city of Shakopee, Minnesota, establishing a moratorium temporarily prohibiting land alteration in the city. Do we have a second? Second it with a friendly amendment to Mr. add Lane. the uh, draft language of lots of one acre or larger or, conti or conti 
a little bit contiguous Contiguous lands. regardless of ownership right. plots of right. one, totaling one acre or more. Yeah. Accepted. Accepted. Mr. Thompson, are we yes. clear yes. on that? Yes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, item 11, council member reports. Um, I thought for a second we'd be in different order, but we're not really. Um, Councilor Whiting. I left my notes up there, but I, we did meet with the school board. Um, they are working on some uh, surveys of people to, uh, citizens to develop uh, ideas for going forward with their, their goals and uh, including possibility of a pre-Labor Day start for schools. So it's, that's just in the discussion phases, uh, some of the ideas they're kicking around. I did not meet with the chamber because of business demands. But. Thank you, sir. Councilor Clay, we'll go down to you. Uh, the Utility Commission, um, they did check on well number 11, which and found that it didn't need any significant cleaning out. They sometimes these wells fill up with sand at the bottom of them. Well 9, which is next, pretty close to well 11 last summer, needed to have a lot of sand removed from it to get it operating well again. So <laughs> save money and it works well. Uh, these last uh, few days of cold, cold temperatures and very high winds uh, did not result in any problems for us, either with water or electricity, um, rather than a car crashing into a power pole. Um, wanted to remind people once again that uh, right now the utilities crews are out um, trying to identify and trimming back trees where that have branches that are starting to conflict with overhead power lines. If you have something like that in your neighborhood or your, your own property, you, um, contact the utilities and let them know and they'll come out and take care of that for you without charge. The Christmas Day power outage. I know the mayor would be interested in this. There are about 950 people without power for a number of hours. Uh, we talked about the cause of it. Um, there were 950 people affected or residences affected. Uh, within the first five to 10 minutes, there were 180 calls to the, uh, to the company that uh, utilities uses after hours for customer service contacts and an additional 68 calls to uh, the utilities phone line in itself all within the first five or ten minutes <laughs> you know it's kind of a deal where you know it's Christmas Day and everybody's home and doing things that require electricity and it just it was just a mad rush of everybody calling at once so it, a lot of people wound up getting busy signals or recordings and stuff but uh, you know, the chances of a power outage like that happening on a holiday <laughs> like that are, are pretty slim but um, are they moving forward with their revised communication plans or have they not talked about that part yet they're still looking at some other ways to kind of help possibly being able to quickly put a message out on, on the website things like that mm -hmm. to help people as well but uh, that's all I got Thank you, sir. Council Layman. I uh, attended 169 Corridor Coalition. They put together their legislative strategy for that February 5th or 6th meeting. 6th. 6th. February 6th meeting. Um, got their speakers lined up. Um, the new Minnesota House legislators are going to be in and Senate, and they're going to meet with them and explain to them the 169 Corridor, what it does. What it's uh, what it needs, and uh, according to Mark Miller from Deed, a large percentage of Minnesota jobs. I mean, a large percentage. I think it was like forty some percent of all Minnesota jobs are located within ten miles of one sixty nine. So there's a huge economic impact <coughs> coming up from the south and from the north. So the whole corridor is, is pretty important, and uh, they've identified the the top projects that, that need to get taken care of. Obviously, 494 and 169 got taken care of, which was a huge one, and that's helping, but there's other problems moving down the corridor. Um, last night, the assistant city administrator and myself met with the fire department on their uh, 
normal Monday night meeting it was a follow-up to a previous meeting that we had concerning uh, uh, some pay discrepancies in their sign and sign out sheets over the last year uh, per period of time and, and I got to say that the system that they're using is pretty antiquated and it's ripe for error not purpose error just the way it's designed with so many people touching it and doing it in so many different manners and so many things to it that uh, it's it's no wonder uh, I think our error rate was pretty low I think we found what six over the course of a year or something like that which is pretty small um, and there was some talk about uh, you know how, how we put a system together that fixes some of these issues and and maybe some policy changes and so on and so forth that we kind of sat in for the rest of the meeting and just listened and offered some input as they asked. Um, the one thing I did ask, or I did say that I would ask about, um, that meeting ran three hours. They get paid for one. That's, just, that's our policy. And I, I, uh, I suspect, in my own opinion, is that uh, the issue of the pay discrepancies and, and paperwork that this assistant admi administrator and myself were there for probably did add to that meeting time. Um, I did tell him that I would ask to see if we could get a, a little bit more of that meeting paid because of that and I would ask council. So normally they're paid one hour for a meeting and that meeting last night was seven to ten is when I, I think the time that I was there. So they already get paid for one, so maybe two hours. It's up to the council. I don't know. I didn't get a number of people that were there to get a good ballpark. I'd say maybe maybe 30. No, it's 46 employees and then 7 to 25 is the listing. Um, it's How many? Like 30 to 35 employees over there. Okay. So there's a lot of faces that I know that are on the fire department that weren't there. So... Consider if the council would consider paying them an extra hour for that meeting. I think it's the fair thing to do. It's four hundred dollars. Yeah. Did you they sign into the meeting? Hang, hanging flower baskets you could get for four hundred dollars? Two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Um, what is process for this, Mr. McNeil? I mean, what? Council's discretion on it. It's a variation from what we typically do. And I think that's why Council Layman is asking. Got it. Um, I would say if we do anything, we should have it. Do we want to brought back to the next meeting? Is that That's fine. what? Is that? Oh, then we're going to spend another $50 of staff time. Let's just have somebody make a motion and see what happens. All right. Without it being a past practice so it comes up again? or. Well, I, and the reason I brought it up is I, is I do think that because of that issue and, and our attendance, we probably did prolong that meeting. If Councillor Lehman is feeling guilty and we can do something to assuage that guilt, I think we <laughs> are obliged to you know, help him out here. So, Councillor Lehman, please make a motion. Uh, make a motion to pay the fire department folks in attendance at the Monday, uh, what was the date, 21st meeting in attendance, an extra hour for that meeting out of the fire department budget. I think it should come from the council okay. discretionary budget. <laughs> council discretionary. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all right, so discussion on this one. We should probably put in there that it's, it's this is a one-time deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's my point. <laughs> sure it is. Well, and and uh, it's only because I do think that that issue uh, – wasn't so who's wasn't really a normal issue for that for their meeting. That was talking. So you know, I, I know. I was just gonna say, is it was it all you talking the whole time, no, or what? No, what no, what no, are you no, trying no, to do? No. Um, no, that's my question. Actually, is it? Chris did a lot more talking than I did. Is it something she that was initiated by the city? Well, it was a follow up to a meeting that was initiated by the department and, and the city uh, since. I and administration and all of us are city. So it was a follow-up to that that happened to happen at that meeting. And, uh, you know, fortunately, there's some very good things coming out of that. 
you know, some, some possible uh, policy, written policy and procedures that clarify a bunch of things um, and different ways of doing things so that down the road we don't have these reoccurring issues. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. All right. Um, and that, are you done with it, Matt? Yes. Um, Councilor Sherman? No report from me this evening. Um, all right, I've got just a couple things. Um, on the 11th scale, had their uh, legislative um, slate, and we had uh, uh, senators and representatives that all are from Scott County. Everybody was there except for uh, Senator Pratt, I believe, was not was the only one who was unable to be there. Um, so it was a very good meeting, very well attended. Um, on the 14th, I had Regional Council of Mayors, and um, we did a lot of talking about um, future planning and um, realizing the future is how it's going to work and, and things like that. It was actually really interesting. Um, and that's uh, it for now. Um, how is the future going to work? Yeah, I was wondering. No, nah, see, I realize I said that really <laughs> stupidly. Um, no, it was future. It was a guy who is. Uh, Just tell us, is there a future? Yes, there is a future, and it's going to be different than the past. And that's his. That was his point. Um, is that we need to unlearn a few things and relearn things. So oh, it was easier. very interesting. Here, I want other. Uh, I just want to see if there was any follow up. Um, driving down third avenue uh we had talked about the dro driveway drops of the newspapers and when the snow is uh, kind of dissipated and the litter is piling up in the streets and alleyways it, it just really looks stacked you know i wondered if we had any more follow-up uh from staff uh we did meet councillor uh, layman was there and they have uh this would be the star tribune and the um uh, weekly freebie that they sent out, uh, we're going to be giving some information out as far as how to opt out of that and also for anybody who is interested we will be ha uh, they would be offering to put up the um, green postal or the newspaper tube on that they did ask that we hold off on that until after the ground thaws because that would create some unrealistic expectations right now but uh, there has been some activity on that and they tried to be as cooperative I think as they could you know what? If it's landing in the street or the boulevard, we could take it up for littering too. Yeah, it's, it's a mess. I think I think I might I might have mentioned that to him too. Yeah. All right, um, item number twelve A under other business, downtown fire station. Uh, we need to go into closed session, I assume. We have a request to go into closed session to consider the uh, sale of city-owned real estate. All right, Council Layman. Make a motion to go into close uh, session to consider sale of city assets. Do we have a second? Second. Move. Councilor Whiting, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passed unanimously. We are. Uh... <laughs>